our foundation was founded in 1960, and we're based up at Coolidge's historic birthplace in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. And part of what we do are educational programs like this one around the country to share Coolidge and his values with more people. We also have a number of summer programs uh, where we try to engage the next generation of uh, policy leaders, uh, youth today. And we have a debate program that brings children from all over the country to the site to learn about President Coolidge and many of his policy areas. And they debate in competition and, and can win college scholarships. Uh, and Rashad is in charge of that program. And we're always looking for judges. So if anyone wants to come and see what's known as the best preserved presidential birthplace in America, and also judge young debaters who are smarter than me and, and probably most of us, uh, you can see Rashad, and he will uh, give you all the information. But anyhow, we think it's fitting that Coolidge and Hoover will team up for this discussion today on the roots and future of American conservatism. Some of you might raise your eyebrows when you hear me say that because it's probably somewhat well known to many of you that Coolidge and Hoover didn't always see eye to eye on everything. In fact, uh, Coolidge called Hoover, not very politely, Wonder Boy. <laughs> He once said something like, you know, uh, that guy gave me advice six days a week, all of it bad. <laughs> and Hoover was, you know, sometimes not too fond of Coolidge either, as you might imagine after statements like that. Uh, Hoover, of course, was a noble uh, fly fisherman, and he was fond of telling other people that Coolidge fished with worms, <laughs> which was decidedly of a noble, you know, less noble type of fisherman. But anyway, uh, Presidents 30 and, and 31 did help each other. Uh, Hoover served uh, very ably as Coolidge's uh, Secretary of Commerce, and Coolidge himself supported Hoover in his bid for the presidency. In fact, in October, I believe it was October 11, 1932, as Coolidge was in his final months before he passed in early 1933, he gave a strong speech in support of of Hoover's 1932 campaign in Madison Square Garden. So anyhow, I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, both of these presidents, their their contributions to conservatism today and as it's developed through the century. Um, so I don't need to talk too much about it because we have real experts to inform us on that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Governor Jim Douglas, who will moderate our first session and will introduce the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Well, thank you all for being here, and feel free to get some more food. We won't be offended at all if you get seconds or thirds as we go along this afternoon. But this is a, an honor for me to be here, not, not only as a trustee of the Coolidge Foundation, but as a uh, former uh, office holder in our state. Uh, we hope you have a chance to visit Plymouth Notch. Uh, be sure you don't come at rush hour. <laughs> well, all right. All right. <laughs> It'd probably be all right. But uh, I want to uh, also uh, reemphasize Matt's invitation to participate in our summer debate program um, uh, as a judge. We're looking for them, and you get a nifty judicial sash. You'll, you'll look like the president of a South American country for a day or two. So, so uh, seriously, get in touch with us if, you, if you'd like to do that. But we're also thrilled, and I know uh, Hamdi um, uh, is as well, to, uh, to be here um, partnering with the, the Hoover Institution. Um, despite the uh, personal <clears throat> uh, dynamics between the two presidents, uh, they certainly share an important uh, uh, link in history that's important for us to, to study and, and to talk about. Uh, it was a key time in the history of uh, the United States and in the uh, history of uh, American conservatism, which is our uh, topic this afternoon. Um, we have uh, three outstanding panelists. I won't uh, go too deeply into their uh, biographies because you have them in front of you, uh, but they'll talk about about um, uh, conservatism at uh, various points in the 20th century. Um, and uh, perhaps we'll get into a good discussion about when uh, conservatism really began in the United States of America and how it's advanced over that, uh, uh, that time and what we might learn from the, uh, from the periods that we'll be uh, discussing on this panel. I'll, I'll first uh, invite Amity Schles to, uh, uh, to uh, make a presentation about the uh, Coolidge era Amity, as uh, Matt noted, is, uh, or as Mike noted, is the CEO of the Coolidge Presidential Foundation and um, uh, the author of several books, the most recent one uh, entitled simply Coolidge. He was laconic, and so Amity chose a brief title to get right to the point, <clears throat> but a great uh, and comprehensive biography of our, of our 30th president. Uh, she's uh, taught economic history at uh, the Stern um, uh, School of Business in New York. She's a presidential scholar now at the uh, uh, King's College in New York City and has also uh, uh, worked at the Bush 43 uh, Presidential Foundation. Then I'll invite uh, David Davenport to talk about uh, the 
Hoover era, and um, David is well known to many of you as the uh, uh, director emeritus of the Washington office here. Um, and um, he's uh, written a, a couple of books, uh, one of which he's brandishing up here at the table on uh, the New Deal and modern American conservatism. Uh, he's a former college president, uh, uh, very well versed in, in that part of our national history. And I'll introduce uh, Lee Edwards, who is a distinguished fellow in conservative thought at the Simon Center for Principles and Politics. He's uh, also uh, involved with the Heritage Foundation. Uh, he teaches at Catholic University. Uh, he's uh, been published in many uh, publications commented uh, quite frequently in the uh, broadcast media, and we're honored to have him with us as well. So in chronological order, Amity, want to kick it off? Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Jim, for this opportunity. The Coolidge Foundation would never be where it is uh, and a presidential foundation now without Governor Jim. Oh, turn on. Can't hear me. Especially that part. I'll say it again. <laughs> Thank you, Governor Jim. The Coolidge Foundation would never be where it is today without Governor Jim Douglas. <laughs> so what, what is our task this afternoon? Um, it's to see if these fellows have any utility for our our present day, for the challenges we confront. Uh, in the pictures of Calvin Coolidge, is that okay? I hear a ring. Do you hear the ring? He's gonna. Okay, he's gonna. Um, when you see Coolidge, and that is also true on the cover of my book, he kind of uh, looks Victorian. Uh, he has a top hat on sometimes. He has a vest. You, you sort of suspect he might have spats if you looked down. Um, and it, it, he uh, he didn't drive particularly. He didn't really like to drive. Um, so. Maybe he was 19th century. I would submit to you today that he played a Victorian because of playing Victorian was useful to his purpose, to the purpose of the causes which were dear to his heart and he believed dear to the country. Um, Coolidge, I, I want to say that it's, it's high time Coolidge and Hoover uh, become friends, even if there were some cracks in the friendship in the past. Uh, and I want Coolidge, before I start to concede, that there's one area where Hoover was foresightful and Coolidge perhaps less so, um, was to build a great institution for his causes. Uh, the Hoover Institution in California at Stanford. Uh, Coolidge fell down on that job for some good and some poor reasons, and we have Margaret Hoover here, and we want to thank her and those institutions, along with you, Dr. David and Mike, uh, for for furthering Hoover. Um, so uh, I think Coolidge would have admired what you have done. If one can posit, uh, you know, counterfactual. Coolidge actually, though, to get back to him, was, wasn't just modern. He was intensely uh, modern. Um, someone today, I think it was Mr. Paul, said uh, he was like Ronald Reagan, but he actually got the things that were planned done. <laughs> That's strong. Uh, um, he did get some of them done. And so I just thought I would go through three areas of concern to us where we're, we're mulling policy, writing about policy, and talk about what Coolidge did in these areas and what that tells us. Um, these areas are faith. I picked the, the fuzziest and hardest one first, fuzziest and thorniest one first, public sector unions and taxation. Starting with faith, um, whether the issue is the Hobby Lobby case and its relationship to health care or abortion or what we teach in schools and what charter or voucher schools may or may not do, the role of faith in our society is contentious. It, it, it never goes away. It was also in Coolidge's time contentious. Um, he took a very interesting and nuanced position on faith. On the one hand, he was a man of great faith. He knew there was a reason that government had to be restrained, and that was actually to leave room for privacy and or faith, what he called things of the spirit. He was well aware that w there were zones of our life where um, material things can do no good. May and the federal government also might not be able to do any good. Perhaps it would be faith and or the local community where the good would be done. Uh, he was well aware that lawmakers were not gods. 
because there was a God in his view. Um, men do not make laws, they do but discover them. And we've held whole seminars on that. That is, he, uh, he was discovering laws right down you know, from the tablets and the Ten Commandments. He didn't feel he or any other government official had the right to write all what people must do, that there were some basic laws that antedate the Constitution as well. So there he fits into a lot of philosophy that we have studied, and that's different from many presidents. He was not as pragmatic in that way. What does it say about social welfare? Well, he was very concerned with local groups, including faith groups, providing help, taking care of their community. When we teach American American history, and I've done this with Jonathan Alter, who's written about Roosevelt. What we usually teach is before Roosevelt, there was nothing. No pension, right? Old oh, people had no pension, social, right? No help for farms, no deposit insurance. Right, banks. Before Roosevelt, there was nothing. No life insurance. It goes on and on. But of course, there was something. There were local groups. Many states had deposit insurance before the federal government had it. Every state had local groups with insurance for burial, right? Mutual societies. Uh, some of you may have read David Beto's book about these societies. Every group, you know, I once studied the Loyal Order of the Moose in Illinois because of their fabulous orphanage, M Moose Heart. So uh, this all existed, uh, it just wasn't federal. And what Coolidge saw was something can exist even if it's not federal in Washington. It can exist where it is and needs to be encouraged. By encouragement, he did not mean, however, federal cash flows to that entity, which is sort of the modern federalism. We like states, so we let them allocate federal money. It wasn't like that. He wanted to support them in raising money, and he went meticulously to every faith group. He's a congregationalist, more or less. He went to every group and exhorted them, and Hoover also did this moral suasion as chief executive president, rather than mandating them or funding them, which would be the modern options. And I want to read to you um, something he wrote, here he's intensely modern too, he had a conference call in 1924 with Jewish philanthropists in New York. It was one of the first conference calls on record. And he commended the Jews for something called the Stuyvesant Pledge, which is now lost in history and also worth teaching, which is um, the Jewish community pledge in New York to Peter Stuyvesant that they would take care of their own. And in exchange, Peter Stuyvesant allowed them to stay. Well, a century plus on, right, um, Coolidge talks to the Jewish leaders about this. And he says, you have always, and you don't have to have Jewish here, you could substitute Catholic, Methodist, because he gave this speech over and over again. The Jewish people, the Catholic people, the Methodist people have always and everywhere been particularly devoted to the ideal of taking care of their own dot, 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 uh, a bit more, and then he went back, I want you to know that I feel you are making good citizens, that you are strengthening the government, big G, by your own independence, that makes our Washington stronger, that you are demonstrating the supremacy of the spiritual life and helping establish the kingdom of God on earth. Well, we don't talk like that anymore. And that to him was part and parcel of that local community work that was so important. We don't have to buy it, but it's interesting. And again, note that in that interaction, he told a philanthropic group, religiously affiliated, that they were helping the government, that is Washington, Big G, but not by either side sending money, right? By, by taking some of the burden off government. And what we failed to do today is allow the states and the towns to take the burden off Washington. We wa Washington is so jealous of its power, so eager to have more, that it doesn't even consider it, it the other way, what states and towns and faith groups might do. Um, he was intensely practical, however, about faith. I want to add that, too. He saw the limits of doctrine of big faith government, you would call it, um, or moralizing in government. And um, this specific issue there that wasn't quite faith but related was prohibition, which came into law around the time he came to Washington. This was the 20s, the decade of prohibition. Um, it was in force. Um, 
Coolidge detested the impracticality of prohibition. You couldn't enforce it, plus it cost a lot. If you, who had to enforce it? The Treasury you had to send Coast Guard clippers out to find the people importing the liquor from England or somewhere and stop the liquor from coming in the United States. He saw that the Treasury was losing money, um, that, uh, uh, both by laying out cash for the enforcement of prohibition and also by um, the inability to tax liquor. Right, that's very important. Good revenue source, right? Um, and I, I, you know, when you go through the media of the period, you can see um, nine million dollars even then for ten new Coast Guard cutters to augment our rum fleet. <laughs> <laughs> Who ran that? Uh, Andrew Mellon for a while. Did Andrew Mellon like it? Not at all. He dis considered it um, a big distraction from the important work of tax cutting, which we'll get to in a minute. But Coolidge saw right through it. He, what he saw was that the worst thing about prohibition, worse than the little cost and the inconvenience and so on, was that it eroded respect for the rule of law because it was honored in the breach rather than the observance. And that to him was anathema. The rule of law, he had another phrase, the reign of law, to him was paramount and always needed defending. And as an officer, even one who might quietly offer a drink to someone, as the president, he saw it as his job to enforce the law as best he could without ever criticizing it while he was in office. Silent Cal was silent for a reason, which was to preserve the consistency of the executive positions. Therefore, as president, he, he enforced that law, and he had the political vision, and this is, uh, Governor Jim knows about this because he's a master of it, to know when an issue is ripe. And he saw that getting rid of prohibition, well, the country wasn't ripe for that yet. We just started with prohibition, this moralizing experiment. And that, that ripeness to end prohibition might not come on his watch. And he was at peace with that, which is uh, another, he, he picked his battles very carefully. And we can learn a lot from that with the legalization of marijuana, for example, either way. Um, and when you have restraint, when you don't butt in, when you end something, uh, he was very, uh, very funny about it. And um, he was in an office just after he came out of the presidency um, where he was having some kind of meeting, maybe here on this street, uh, and uh, someone informed him that before this group had been in the office, the prohibitionists had had it before. Um, and Coolidge said, well, I'm sure they fumigated it well. <laughs> that gives you a sense of his opinion of prohibitionists. But he never would have said that during the presidency. Uh, interesting, right? Number two, unions. Um, today we have concern about public sector unions. Maybe we like teachers. Maybe we like policemen. Maybe we, you know, we, we respect their service, but we feel that you, public sector unions are overstepping, that towns and states have overstepped in promising money to them, future pensions or health care, that states and towns cannot afford. That question of unions going too far and their cost, public sector unions specifically, too, came up rather dramatically in Coolidge's day. In fact, I don't think Scott Walker could imagine the drama. Uh, of what went on. I, I, I struggled very hard about where to put this in my book in, in a way it should go first because it, it was so dramatic. Coolidge happened to be governor of Massachusetts, which happened to be a progressive state. And it happened uh, by an oddity of Massachusetts law, Bay State law, th that the governor was at the top of the chain of command for the Boston police, the police for the capital city. And what about the police of Boston? You want to, uh, this was in the, in the night, it was 1918, 1919, as World War I is coming to a close. And here's what you want to imagine about the Boston police. We have their journal so we can see it. They were way underpaid. No question about it. There was inflation and no one was acknowledging it. Prices went up 40% or more. Their pay did not change. There was no such thing in cola, as colas in that period, right? There wasn't even an understanding of what inflation was. Two, their station houses were disgusting. They had leather helmets. The rats chewed on the leather helmets. They had showed the teeth marks. They were loved. They had worked overtime, the policemen. They were mounted policemen. They had horses. The city was not totally electrified, so there were no 
red, red light, green light, right? Policemen did that with white gloves. Um, and they were new Americans, Irish Americans mostly in Boston. And by the way, Irish Americans are one of the groups who elected Coolidge over and over again. The Republican Party then, as now, was neurotic about immigrants. And one reason Coolidge rose to national prominence, prominence was that he was very good at getting the immigrant vote, including the Irishman. Um, public opinion seemed with the union men, the policemen, um, they wanted to go on strike and then they did go on strike. They did not affiliate with the communists. There was that question whether they were really radical. They affiliated with Sam Gompers, who's supposed to be a mild union man, and the American Federation of Labor. But, um, and I want to mention the, the, the love for these policemen was so great. It was kind of like the Budweiser commercial, right? They had their horsies. And when their horsey saw them on the street, the horse would whinny after the policeman because the horses loved the policemen and Bostonians knew it. It was in the paper. They went on strike. They left their horses. There was mayhem. People was hurt, were hurt. Coolidge, the governor, um, oversaw someone uh, to fire the policeman, which was very, very hard, and he called out the guard, men with bayonets. And he, uh, everyone couldn't believe it. Um, and uh, Sam Gompers begged him to reconsider and that the policeman would come back and maybe would accept very good terms, easy terms, if he would only let the policeman come back. Um, and Coolidge said, there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, any time. I'll say it again. There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, any time. That is, he took a very unexpectedly hard line. Wow. What he did with that was turn public opinion. He didn't have public opinion. He turned it. That's a great leader, a politician. Even Wilson, the president, lined up behind him. And it's clear that Coolidge became national material because of that extremely tough call, which, by the way, advantaged the country very well because people saw in the public sector unions shouldn't strike, and there were fewer strike days and less turmoil in the 20s, leading to greater productivity and even higher wages. Um, I want to talk just very briefly about tax. Um, those of you who know, um, we have a large tax debate today about what we should do with taxation. Should we have a lot of credits or should we reduce rates? Coolidge was on the rate side because he believed that the top tax rate was a symbol, not just um, a behavioralist mechanism, but also a symbol to people. And when it was lower, people would work harder. Coolidge beat Reagan in this area um, with Mellon, his Treasury Secretary. They cut the top marginal rate to 25% after great labors. And I commend the statistics of income, uh, statistics of income of the 20s to you for review because if you go to them, you will see that when they cut the marginal tax rate in the 20s, they got more money than expected at the Treasury. It was a beautiful supply side experiment. Coolidge, a moralist, was kind of ambivalent about it. Mellon was the, the behavioralist, but that is indeed what happened in the Coolidge experiment. So you might want to have a look at that. Um, I'm going to stop now and say there's one area I, re I, I forgot um, that I'm going to mention where we aren't concerned about what Coolidge was concerned about, and that area is debt. And you want to ask why we are not concerned. He was incredibly uh, concerned ab about federal debt, about general debt, and if you want to know one thing about Coolidge, it's that when he left office after 67 months, the debt, the uh, federal budget was actually lower than when he came in. Uh, not, not just growing more slowly, but actually lower. That was a, a tremendous feat. And he felt in the longer term, a nation that might seem attractive might one day become less attractive as the US now, and that then having a balanced budget would be attractive and stabilizing for the country. So I hope we can all think about that too. Debt discussions are not popular now, but perhaps they may become more so in future. And at that point, Coolidge model is well worth our study. Thank you. Thank you, Amity. Thanks. David. Uh, conventional wisdom has it that modern American conservatism began in the 1950s, and I'm sure my, our friend Lee will make a very convincing case of that. 
But more recently, people have been trying to push that a little further back in time. And so uh, George Nash came out with his edited volume, actually written by President Hoover, uh, The Crusade Years, uh, sort of making this case. Gordon Lloyd and I did our book about a year and a half ago, uh, The New Deal and Modern American Conservatism, sort of making a similar case. Then uh, Amity pushes it even further back to the 1920s and to Calvin Coolidge. So at least, you know, as a starting point, we can agree, perhaps, uh, at least Amity and I can agree, that we do have to go further back probably than, than the 1950s to find the roots of modern American conservatism. I face a challenge in talking about Herbert Hoover that Amity doesn't face in talking about Coolidge. I face the challenge of demonstrating that Hoover was conservative. Um, <laughs> we both face the question of whether they are relevant to modern conservatism conservatism today, as I said, I have the additional challenge of, of arguing whether Hoover was conservative. Uh, Stephen Horwitz did uh, a Cato uh, paper a couple of years ago that he titled Herbert Hoover, Father of the New Deal, uh, not so subtly arguing that, uh, that Hoover put in place all the things that were really needed for the New Deal, and then FDR came along and just blew on the fire, and, and the New Deal uh, exploded. Um, the historian David, Stanford historian David Kennedy, in his history of the period, uh, acknowledges that Hoover was, quote, no Mossback conservative in the Harding Coolidge mold. So if he was a conservative, he was at least different than the conservatives that we had seen in the years before. I think this is a tricky question because, in my view, Hoover led was involved in public leadership through three different phases, at least two, and I would say maybe even three. There was the, his leadership in the Roaring Twenties, a time of post-war growth and reconstruction um, as Secretary of Commerce, then initially as President. There was leadership during the Great Depression, which I think we would all agree is a, was an extraordinary event calling for a different sort of leadership, perhaps. Then he was a leader in the face of the New Deal, so the, the crusading years of the 1930s, sort of making the case against the excesses of the New Deal. So in my view, to really answer the question whether Herbert Hoover was a conservative, you'd, you'd really kind of have to look at the demands of each of those three I think distinct, fairly distinct historic periods. Um, Gordon Lloyd from, from Pepperdine and I did two pieces about a year and a half ago uh, about Hoover. We did a chapter called The Two Phases of Herbert Hoover's Conservatism for a book uh, uh, edited by um, uh, Postel and O'Neill called Toward an American Conservatism, um, in which we argued that there were two distinct phases, at least, of Herbert Hoover's conservatism that were again appropriate to each time. The first phase was during the 1920s, a time of post-war recovery. And you know, as we see later with Eisenhower, the sort of conservatism one practices in a period of post-war recovery probably looks a little different than uh, conservatism in some other times. Um, his, he really had, I think, two principles during the 1920s, which strike me as appropriately conservative for that time. He had his principle of constructive government, and he had his principle of American individualism, both of which I think continue to be relevant to conservatism today. Constructive government to Hoover, I think we have to bear in mind that in the 20s, the, the present conservative obsession with size of government was really not an issue in the 1920s. The proper role of government was really the issue. The proper role of the federal government, as Amity rightly points out, was really an appropriate conservative issue, I think, in the 1920s. And, and here, Hoover's contribution, I think, was to try to keep the focus on private associations and individuals and businesses, and the government as more of a catalyst, convener, and partner, uh, which I think is an appropriately conservative role. He convened hundreds of conferences as both Secretary of State and as President, the purpose of which was really for industry, for business, for individuals to teach government, if you will, about 
these areas that they were engaged in and, and, and even regulating in many cases. Uh, and um, it was this sort of collaboration that Hoover really tried to promote uh, through these uh, various conferences. Government as the catalyst but not the designer uh, of solutions, uh, someone has said. And as Hoover himself said, never a direct player in the economy, one of his strongest principles. He told a group of Iowa farmers in 1925, quote, every time we find solutions outside of government, we have not only strengthened national character, but we have preserved our sense of self-government. Uh, another of his biographers, Richard Norton Smith, said he, quote, turned commerce from a themeless hodgepodge of bureaucratic leftovers into a dynamic laboratory of his theory of a federal government eager to encourage private associations as a path to progress. So this, I think, was his notion of constructive government. Again, not in a time when size of government wasn't so much the issue is what role will government play in a time of aggressive growth? Uh, new industries were sprouting up, and Hoover acknowledged the need to have federal government involvement in radio, for example, in aviation, for example, two new industries that were developing at the time. Uh, but in most areas, it, it was, in his view, not the role of the federal government to lead, but it was the role of private associations, private businesses to inform and to uh, bring to Washington uh, their ideas and, and, and their association with the government. It was admittedly a vigorous role. Uh, Hoover was a vigorous Secretary of Commerce. He intended, I think, to be a vigorous president, um, but it was a limited role. So that was his notion of constructive uh, government. The other principle of his conservatism in the 1920s I, I call American individualism. He did a wonderful essay uh, called uh, American Individualism. The New York Times Book Review called it one of the few great formulations of American political theory. If you've never read this essay, it's really worth uh, reading, American Individualism. And it's not it's not the rugged individualism that we sometimes associate with Hoover. Uh, it's, it is individualism with a communitarian bent. Um, that's really Hoover's style of individualism. Uh, it's the balance of individual initiative, but also concern for a community of virtue, of human uh, decency. It's what Tocqueville uh, called uh, self-interest rightly understood. And it talks about the, the various isms uh, that were unfolding in Europe and how dangerous that was to human liberty and to the human spirit uh, and, and how wonderful it was that in America this sense of liberty al allowed individual initiative and communal, communitarian uh, kind of response. So those were really the two legs of his leadership, I would say, in the 1920s, a time of, of growth and recovery. Uh, on the one hand, constructive government. On the other hand, American individualism. Then along came, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll skip his presidency for the moment. We can talk about that later if you'd like. But the second phase, I think, of his conservatism that's worth even more study for us today comes in the face of the New Deal. And, and Gordon Lloyd and I argue uh, that, in fact, the New Deal was America's French Revolution. Uh, that if Edmund Burke is the father of modern conservatism, pushing back against uh, the excesses of the French Revolution, um, we argue there's a distinctive brand of American conservatism. And it was essentially born in response to the New Deal. Uh, the New Deal is still, in my view, the paradigm for American domestic policy, tax policy, economic policy today, after 80 years, still going strong, uh, pretty remarkable uh, in itself. Uh, but the, And the man on the scene at the time was Herbert Hoover. Uh, not that he got a strong following for what he said at the time. He was probably in this sense more like the John the Baptist voice crying in the wilderness. Um, but if you read the crying uh, that he was doing, it, it's remarkably perceptive. And really, it lays the foundation for modern American conservatism today, which is still responding to the New Deal. The New Deal is still the paradigm, and we're still, conservatives are still catching up to and responding to uh, the New Deal. So in that sense, it's highly relevant. Uh, Frank Meyer uh, said that, um, yes, 
yes, he didn't get a strong following. That came in the 1950s. Frank Meyer said that modern American conservatism in the 1950s was a delayed response to the New Deal. Well, Her Herbert Hoover's response, again, not widely followed, was on the scene at the time, contemporary. Uh, that's what George Nash's uh, book, uh, The Crusade Years, uh, really documents so well. So what was he saying in the 1930s that's relevant to today? He was saying uh, maybe three things, but as I look at my watch, I'm going to say two things. Uh, first, he says the real challenge uh, of the New Deal is a challenge to liberty. It's, that's the title of, of one of his two primary books at the time. That was his biggest concern. That should suit conservatives extremely well because liberty, individual liberty, Edmund Burke, Herbert Hoover, Today, this really, I think, should be the big conservative theme. And Hoover's concern is that here we had all of these forms of statism and socialism and totalitarianisms in Europe that were fighting to get a hearing. And here in America, he said, we're giving in to them. We're inviting those isms to come into America and, and sort of take over. He had a line that I think really captures it. He says, Roosevelt's concerned about the forgotten man. He ought to be concerned about the forgotten woman, referring to the Statue of Liberty, uh, which he said was really the what was being damaged by the New Deal. Um, he said, the spiritual and intellectual freedoms cannot thrive ex except where there are also economic freedoms. So his concern was that all of this growth in government and government planning uh, and running of the economy economy was not just an economic threat, it was a threat to the spiritual and moral uh, texture of, of America and of its people. Um, in a debate that, that would be very contemporary today, he took Roosevelt's you know, one-third ill-clad, ill-housed uh, that, that FDR was concerned about, and Hoover said, well, you know, first of all, he didn't agree that it was one third, but he said, let's say it's 25%. The other 75% are what are going to be able to solve this problem for the 25%. And so if we adopt a lot of economic policies that make it impossible for the 75% to operate in, with freedom and creativity and growth, we're never going to solve the problem of the 25%. He was concerned that the, what he called the emergency encroachments um, on liberty in the New Deal were being made permanent. And, and so that was his number one concern, very perceptive, I think, not just the emergency response of the New Deal, not just economic planning and what he called economic regimentation, but what this would do to liberty, to freedom, to the spirit and moral tone in, in America. His second big concern about the New Deal was its challenge to constitutionalism, that we were changing from liberty under a constitutional system to one of regimentation and bureaucratic uh, domination. And I think he, he was obviously very prophetic here. And in, in our book, I think, and certainly in this chapter in, in, in the book Toward an American Conservatism, Gordon and I found two amazing Constitution Day speeches, one in 1935 by Hoover and one in 1937 by Roosevelt. And it's fascinating to just lay those two Constitution Day speeches alongside each other. Hoover's was basically about the ten, the first ten amendments to the Constitution and how that guarantees liberty, the people's liberty, from government. And his second theme was about federalism, about the balances of power, about the checks and balances and how important those are to preserving liberty. That was his notion of a Constitution Day speech. FDR's notion was, his, his speech was about we the people. He said the first three words of the Constitution are we the people. And if we the people decide there's a problem to be solved, we can't let some document get in the way. We the people can grab this by the horns and we can solve these problems under the Constitution because the Constitution begins with we the people. In a sense, it was again a foreshadowing of the classic sort of textualism, originalism of Hoover, though not called that in those days, and the living, Roosevelt's living constitution, if you will. We the people can do whatever we want because we are really in charge of the constitution. One specific that I think was very, very perceptive that Hoover called out with some nice historic references from Europe was the special danger of the legislature becoming secondary to the executive. 
he pointed out that this was, uh, in history, this was the beginning of a major problem for freedom and for democracies when the legislature sort of takes second place and the executive becomes paramount. He has some really strong uh, uh, material and ideas uh, about that. And uh, uh, we can talk about that further later if you'd like to. So in my, in my view, uh, modern American conservatism is essentially a response to the New Deal. And Herbert Hoover was the one who first framed the response. I mean, in his, his writings, his speaking, he went on a two-year speaking tour a couple of years after his presidency. He tried to stay on the sideline. He said something like, on tax, I'm silent. On economic policy, I'm silent. Even on fishing, I am silent, you know, kind of his great, his great love. But after a couple of years, you could just kind of see the frustration build up. And he went on an amazing two-year speaking and writing tour where these ideas began to come out. Um, I well, I'll have to change my notes. I was actually thinking about referring to Coolidge as pre-modern, but ha but Amity and I have become good friends, and we're we're we're, we're personally trying to heal the Coolidge Hoover. So so I'm crossing that out, and I'm saying he's only pre. I think Coolidge is only pre-modern in this sense. I think the modern political challenge is the New Deal, and I think Hoover was the first respondent to that challenge, and so I think um, although Ho Coolidge had some wonderful personal qualities and. I loved Anna, Amity's book, and she's made me a fan. She's miraculously, she's fueled, I've, I've told her, she's fueled the Coolidge is Cool movement, and that can't have been easy. You know? <laughs> but, but I think the sense in which uh, Hoover is importantly modern, if you will, is because he began responding to the modern welfare state, the height of progressivism, which is the New Deal, and began to frame the response which has become, by now, modern American conservatism. Hmm. Thank you, Dave. Mm. Yep. Thank you. Well, Lee. <clears throat> well, as we've heard from uh, Amity and David, the, uh, the genesis of the modern conservative movement can be told in many different ways. Well, this afternoon I'm going to offer the story of a book, a magazine, and a political campaign. The book is The Conservative Mind by the intellectual historian Russell Kirk, published in 1953. The magazine is National Review, founded by editor-author William F. Buckley, Jr. in 1955. And the political campaign is Senator Barry Goldwater's 1964 presidential campaign, which was described by one of its managers as a glorious disaster. <laughs> well, of the many excellent books by conservative authors in the 40s and the 50s, I believe the conservative mind deserves first place because of its immediate and enduring impact. Consider, before the publication of The Conservative Mind, Lionel Trilling, the premier liberal intellectual of the day, wrote that, quote, liberalism is not only the dominant, but even the sole intellectual tradition in America. The conservative impulse, Trilling said, was not thoughtful at all but made up of, at best, quote, irritable mental gestures which seem to resemble ideas. <laughs> and yet, and yet, in the spring of 1953, Russell Kirk, a 34-year-old assistant professor of history at, at all places, Michigan State College, published his seminal work, The Conservative Mind. Now, liberals were initially dismissive. The title was an obvious oxymoron. You know, conservatives had, had impulses, mental gestures, even delusions, as Richard Hofstadter wrote. But they produced nothing, nothing approaching serious, rational thought. But lib liberals were brought up short when they read The Conservative Mind a 450-page overview of conservative thinking and writing in the previous 150 years. Kirk wrote that the essence of conservatism lay in six ideas. And I think that here we are all these years since the publication, and it's uh, pretty much they still hold up very, very well. Number one, a divine intent as well as personal conscience rules society. Traditional life is filled with variety and mystery, while most radical systems are characterized by a narrowing uniformity. 
civilized society requires order and classes. Property and freedom are inseparably connected. Man must control, that means woman as well as man, man must control his will and his appetite knowing that he is governed more by emotion than by reason. And finally, society must alter, but slowly. Conservative mind was an impressive feat of scholarship, and it was a synthesis of the ideas of leading Anglo-American conservative thinkers, writers, politicians of the late 18th century through the mid-20th century, including Edmund Burke, John Adams, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Orestes Bronson, Benjamin Disraeli, George Santayana, and T.S. Eliot. The work demonstrated convincingly that there had been a conservative tradition in America since the founding. With one book, just one book, Kirk made conservatism intellectually acceptable. In fact, he gave the conservative movement its name. Consider this. Before the conservative mind, Bill Buckley, in his first book, God and Man at Yale, described himself not as a conservative, but an individualist. But when he launched National Review two years after the conservative mind had appeared, he called himself and his magazine conservative. When Barry Goldwater first ran for the U.S. Senate in 1952, he said he was a Jeffersonian Republican. But when he published his best-selling political manifesto in 1960, he did not title it The Conscience of a Jeffersonian Republican, <laughs> but the conscience of a conservative. So, with the publication of The Conservative Mind, along with earlier appearances of Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, Weaver's Ideas Have Consequences, and Whitaker Chambers' Witness, the essential conservative canon, representing the traditional libertarian and anti-communist strains of conservatism, was in place. But, in the mid-1950s, conservative ideas did not seem to be taking hold in many American minds. Conservative politicians found themselves far from the center of the public square. The Republican Party rested securely in the hands of the Eastern establishment, which even tried to remove Richard Nixon from the 1956 ticket because he was not someone of their making. Conservative victories, wrote Bill Buckley, were uncoordinated and inconclusive. Why? Because the philosophy of freedom was not being expounded systematically in the universities and in the media. A new journal was needed to combat the liberals, to compensate for conservative weakness in the academy, and to focus the energies of the movement. So Buckley joined forces with the German emigre intellectual Willy Schlamm. Both men believe that the way to change American politics was to challenge the liberal intellectuals who dominated America's ideas, and that the best vehicle for doing so was a weekly intellectual magazine like the liberal New Republic. In a prospectus intended for potential financial supporters and writers, they wrote that the political climate was fashioned by serious opinion journals, and that it was possible to rout intellectually the jaded liberal status quo with the vigor of true convictions. Hayek himself had made a similar point that the climate of public opinion was shaped by what he called the professional secondhand dealers in ideas, that is, journalists, teachers, ministers, lecturers, publicists, writers, and artists. Buckley welded together an impressive broad-based intellectual coalition. Traditionalists like Russell Kirk, libertarians like Frank Chodorov, anti-communists like James Burnham. From the beginning, Bill Buckley was a master fusionist and a master diplomat, reconciling the contradictory views of his opinionated editors and contributors. It was known that he went to Frank Meyer, for example, the libertarian, and said, Frank, I want to assure you that Russell Kirk does not hate you. He wants to work with you. He's looking forward to doing this. Then he went 
to, of course, you know, the other chap and said, I want to assure you that Russell does not hate you, Frank. He wants to work with you. He loves you. Let's get the two of you to work together. Uh, only Bill Buckley would have been able to get Russell Kirk and Frank Meyer to be on the same masthead and to be more or less uh, simpatico friends for as long as they were. The launching of National Review was not just an intellectual event, but a deliberate political act, one of a handful that shaped the modern American conservative movement in the post-World War II period. At the same time, a new political star was rising in the West. Senator Barry Goldwater was the grandson of a Jewish peddler who became an American millionaire. He was a college dropout whose little book, The Conscience of a Conservative, sold 3.5 million copies, not bad, and was once required reading in History 169B at Harvard. That was probably uh, maybe our friend uh, Harvey Mansfield was responsible for that. <laughs> Goldwater delighted in challenging conventional wisdom but used the Constitution as his guide. Now he voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964 because he said that Titles 2 and 7 were unconstitutional. And he predicted that Title 7 regarding unemployment would surely lead to affirmative action and quotas as it did. In his manifesto, The Conscience of a Conservative, Goldwater said that the future of freedom in America depended upon the election of public officials who pledged to enforce the Constitution and who proclaimed, quote, my aim is not to pass laws, but to repeal them. <laughs> Conservatives, young and old, liked the sound of that and proceeded to draft Goldwater to run for the Republican nomination for president in 1964. It was a true draft. Goldwater wanted to remain in the Senate where he was comfortable and effective. He even had real doubts about his intellectual ability to be president. He once told a reporter, you know, I really have a second class brain. And all the polls showed him losing to President Kennedy, but, and this is not remembered perhaps as much as it should be, by November 1963, just weeks before the assassination, Goldwater had become the leading presidential candidate among Republicans and a time survey revealed that a Kennedy-Goldwater race would be, and I quote, breathlessly close. And then a pro-Castro leftist assassinated President Kennedy, erasing all political calculations. The bullet that killed John Kennedy also killed Barry Goldwater's chances to become president. The American people would not want three presidents in just one year. And yet Goldwater still announced his candidacy for the nomination, unwilling to disappoint the millions of conservatives, especially young conservatives like Ed Fulner and myself, who looked to him as their champion. Now rarely, rarely does a presidential candidate run knowing beyond a reasonable doubt that he cannot win. But every poll showed LBJ receiving more than 70% and no Republican approaching 30%. Still, Goldwater ran because he said, I want to offer a conservative choice and not a liberal echo. He addressed in a serious way the issues that have occupied the national debate ever since. Social security, government subsidies, federalism, privatization, morality in government, and victory in war. The campaign strategist John Sears argued that Goldwater changed the rhetoric of politics by challenging what? The principles of the New Deal, something no Democrat or Republican before him had dared to do. For his part, President Johnson was determined to win by the largest landslide ever, eclipsing the historic 1936 victory of his political idol, Franklin D. Roosevelt. One can say that for Johnson, extremism in the pursuit of the presidency was no vice. <laughs> Johnson filled his speeches with warnings about the danger of voting for an extremist. He played on the public sphere of nuclear war. And with the White House's approval, 
the CIA illegally planted a spy in the national headquarters of the Goldwater campaign who passed along advanced copies of Goldwater's speeches and schedule so the Democrats were able to respond to a Goldwater speech almost before he finished giving it. With Johnson's approval, the FBI illegally bugged Goldwater's campaign plane and his campaign offices in Washington, D.C., enabling the White House to hear the most confidential conversations and plans of the candidate and his staff. And I challenge Robert Caro to include that in his biography of Lyndon Baines Johnson. I was in my biography of Barry Goldwater, published 20 years ago this year. It'll be coming out in a new edition, I'm happy to say, later this year. And it was not picked up by the media, but he bugged it. How do I know? Because when I interviewed Robert Mardian in 19, well, didn't even know him in 70, that's when he visited with J. Edgar Hoover, when Mardian went to work for the Department of Justice. Mardian visiting with J. Edgar Hoover, still the director of the FBI, talking about various security measures, said, well, we heard that maybe some things were going on by the FBI in the campaign. Did you and did the FBI bug the Goldwater campaign? Hoover looked Martin in the eye and said, yes. Martin said, why? Hoover said, you do what the president tells you to do. Well, led by the columnist Walter Lippmann, after the landslide victory for Lyndon Johnson, liberal commentators declared approvingly that the conservative movement was stone cold dead. James Resson of the New York Times wrote that Barry Gowder not only lost the presidential election, but the conservative cause as well. Conservatives defiantly disagreed. A guy named Ronald Reagan, who had given a widely hailed TV address for Goldwater in the last week of the campaign, said that, quote, the landslide majority did not vote against the conservative philosophy. They voted against a false image our liberal opponents successfully mounted. Human events summed up the impact of the Goldwater candidacy. Quote, the Republican Party is essentially conservative. Now, the South is developing into a major pivot of its power. And a candidate who possesses Goldwater's virtues but lacks some of his handicaps can win the presidency. One liberal who understood that Goldwater was not just another presidential also ran was Teddy White, who wrote, quote, Again and again in American history, it has happened that the losers of the presidency contributed almost as much to the permanent tone and dialogue of politics as did the winners. I believe that Barry Goldwater was the most consequential loser in modern presidential politics. His run for the presidency marked the transformation of the conservative movement from an intellectual into a political movement that became a governing movement with the election of Ronald Reagan. George Will got it right when he wrote that Barry Goldwater won in 1964. It just took 16 years to count the votes. <laughs> Well, Lee, thank you very much. I think you and Ed are still young conservatives, by the way. <laughs> the 64 campaign was my first political memory of stuffing envelopes for the candidate. And we, we had this uh, beverage that we were selling in county headquarters. Anybody else recall it? A, a carbonated beverage, AUH2O. <clears throat> it was uh, yeah. tasteless and awful, but it, it, it was, was a fundraiser. Yeah. And Goldwater said it was awful, too. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, well um, uh, I want to make sure that uh, everyone has a chance to get into the discussion, but Amity, any uh, rebuttal? Uh, uh, Lee says that conservatism <coughs> wasn't even talked about until the 50s or 60s. <laughs> Many of the principles, Goldwater, I, I think uh. I'm off again. Many of the principles Goldwater enunciated were earlier enunciated by Coolidge and even Hoover. I did uh, dig around to find a Goldwater reference to Coolidge and I didn't find a very good one. Have you found one? Have you ever seen Goldwater speaking about Calvin Coolidge? <clears throat> and if he was avoiding him, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a result of our panel, I am going to look for one and I'm going to find one. But I, I have not, not. Yeah. 
I'll just yeah. stop. We're, I'll just stop there. Yeah. And Coach didn't talk about gold water no, either, did he? Go ahead, but, Margaret. But Buckley talked about Hoover. One of Buckley's first stops for fundraising for National Review is a, um, actually there's an essay that William F. Buckley wrote about his meeting with the ex-president when he goes to, to visit with him and to pitch this idea for this conservative the magazine, magazine. Right. And, and get sort of Hoover's yeah. blessing and then maybe Hoover's help. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a, a, a link right there. there. Yeah. Thanks. Ken? David, your point that modern conservatism kind of started with rebuttal to the New Deal, but then you also used the word progressivism in there. I mean, the New Deal was kind of the 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 victory or the the harvest of progressivism. So can't don't you really go back to that? And doesn't that therefore make Coolidge uh, a little more perhaps significant than just uh, Herbert Hoover's predecessor? Well, yeah. I mean, I do think the New Deal is the is the height of progressivism. It was its master sort of achievement, and and it persists. And and in some ways, I mean, I think one reason conservatives have fallen in love with Coolidge again is in some ways he was the last non-progressive president. Mm. Uh, uh, admittedly, Hoover was uh, an activist, as I said, vigorous government, though uh, channeled and controlled. And then I didn't really talk about his presidency because it would take 20 minutes just to talk about that alone. But he obviously, in response to the Great Depression, although he limited his response in many ways that frustrated people, uh, he nevertheless undertook measures that a true conservative might not undertake facing that challenge. So in some ways, uh, Hoover was certainly more progressive than Coolidge. Um, but as I said, I think really the, the you know, they, they say, um, what is it, uh, uh, neoconservatives are liberals who were mugged by reality. I mean, in a sense, Hoover was mugged by the New Deal. I think even Hoover did not see what heights the New Deal would take. And, and so, um, really, I think he was sort of awakened in the 1930s to uh, what he sees as a, just a much greater challenge than, than he could have envisioned. Sure. My question would be, if we go back to the 1912 election, Go back to the 1912 election. Is there a conservative candidate in that election? It's T.R., right? Mm, well, he was a progressive, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so, so it was Taft. 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 No. Yeah. Taft. So T.R. Taft and Wilson, right? Yeah. Right. So right. I, I, I want to tell a little anecdote about that. Um, the, the, many in the Republican Party were very angry there wasn't a more serious conservative candidate as much as they might like Taft, as affable and interesting as he was. Um, and at that time, Coolidge was a very young politician. Uh, and he, he was furious with Theodore Roosevelt for losing the election for the GOP, right, for splitting the, the party, and that was the number one thought even before the ideas, whether, whether, whether TR was right. It was the disloyalty, because he believed in party discipline, of TR to break off out of vanity. And Coolidge uh, wrote to his father that he himself in Massachusetts for some state office had to run against one of those bull moose. But I don't know what happened to him because he went away. <laughs> <laughs> Coolidge won whatever little contest that was, mayor, something like that. Uh, so they were aware, um, very aware, that there was not a conservative, and they were equally aware that a disunity leads to defeat. And you have to remember those, those both together. Um, y y y within a party, it's very hard to speak up for the old way because it's uncool too, right? And we have some of that right now in our economic debate. If you say what Reagan said, you are uncool. But sometimes the uncool is the useful. Uh, and so a lot of the, the uh, traditional Republican conservatives in 12 were silent out of fear of being uncool, unmodern. Uh, and maybe that cost them as well. But you're using a word, uncool that we don't understand. <laughs> what I mean is unfashionable. If we're, if we're conservative, we 
are using a, a word that we don't want to use <laughs> because we're going along with, well, the coolest dude you can think of. Well, even even uh, <laughs> well, in in that way, Tr kind of hijacked the party, right? Uh, but but uh, even the conservatives want votes, and this is a period where new voters were coming in. Women, everyone knew women would be coming. And what would women vote for? You think of why was Warren Harding the candidate in 1920? One reason was that he was considered extremely good looking and would appeal to women. I kind of see that, I find that a little bit difficult to understand, <laughs> uh, but never mind. So you want to remember the first duty of a party is survival. Uh, and sometimes, uh, sometimes too much is compromised <clears throat> for that duty. Or maybe the better part would have been to go away and fight another day. Uh, you know, right? Mm -hmm. Amy, could you speak a little bit to um, the New Deal, or, or the Great Depression, I should say, as, as a foil? Because um, when, when I listen to uh, Mr. Edwards speak and think about the ways that um, figures like Buckley and Goldwater sort of completely forgot about Coolidge and, and Hoover. Um, I think maybe that's partially because of the experience of the Great Depression and the fact that um, in the wake of the Great Depression, the Republican Party lost four straight presidential elections in a row. And um, the orthodoxy about Coolidge and Hoover being the, the cause of the Great Depression. Um, I'm going to speak, but I'd like to ask true. the colleagues to speak too. Then that's my colleague Rashad Thomas <coughs> of the Coolidge Foundation. The, un <coughs> uh, the unspoken question in every room like this um, is always, but didn't Coolidge and Hoover cause the Great Depression, or didn't they fail to stop it? And therefore, we cannot admire them because we're associated; they're associated with the Great Depression, right? Um, but Coolidge did not cause the Great Depression. We can answer that short as Coolidge would, and neither did Hoover. The Great Depression was a long event. Every year, a recovery always makes a choice. Uh, every year, the recovery chose to stay away for a different reason. And in the late, what makes the Great Depression great? Well, it was so long. What else makes it great? The unemployment was usually above 10% and sometimes closer to 20. Uh, when you go back and look at the 30s and really study it, and that's part of David's revision too, you find that the government made the depression long. And a lot of that blame goes to President Roosevelt and to his party and to his ideas and progressive ideas transformed into democratic ideas and so on. Um, so mm. you have to get any room past that question. If, if um, if, if I believe Rashad, and it's important work to establish what happened in the Depression, and David tried, and I tried in the Forgotten Man book, um, and all of us uh, should always try. That's our work because it's harder to admire, you, uh, to put forward Coolidge and Hoover um, when you always have the question, especially by the way when speaking to college audiences. Right, because you know what they what college hears from their teachers, so so that's important work. It's hard work, but we need we need to do it. Do you want to answer that? Uh, I would just just say quickly this that I remember that when we started uh, Young Americans for Freedom, which is 19, 1960, uh, that um, Hoover was on our list of of people to get. I mean, he by by nineteen sixty he was accepted as a conservative. Mm -hmm. And he was somebody whom we wanted to bring on as on our advisory board, uh, and we, we were very much conscious, and we didn't blame him for the for the New Deal because John T. Flynn and other writers like that, John Chamberlain and others, had written enough about what really caused the Great Depression. We said, "Oh, I guess we don't you know blame Mr. Hoover for that," and we admired him as someone who all of these years have been out there fighting for conservative ideas and principles. I have to say, I'm sorry, Amity. You know, I can't think of, of any reference to Coolidge at all. I mean, I I, I plead guilty. I, I I have no explanation for it. I just say that's the case. So, uh, Mia culpa, 
Um, and so I'm going to have to do a little more work on that myself and make sure that he gets the credit he's due. No, we at COPA, we're all going to we're all going to look into it. <laughs> <laughs> I just add, I, I won't comment further on the cause of the depression, <clears throat> but I would also say on the cure. I mean, I think by now. Most historians would say that it, the cure was not, in fact, right. the New Deal. Yeah. The fact was the economic yeah. gearing up for World War II, Two. the the military right. buildup, the industrial buildup that accompanied that, and so, you know, the argument that. Well, if Hoover had only done more in terms of a big government response faster, it would have made a difference. Well, A, economists, you know, in both the Great Depression and the more recent Great Recession, many of them argued that government policies actually prolonged the, the uh, Depression and Recession. And secondly, it wasn't big government solutions that ultimately solved uh, the, the Great Depression. Uh, I think most would now agree. So uh, I, I think either, neither at the start of it nor by the end of it, I think, could we really say that you know conservative principles were to, were to blame. But I think Americans don't aren't perceptive enough no, they're not. in their American history mm -hmm. to appreciate those distinctions. It, it seems to me, following on this thought, um, George Nash, who's who you all know is one of Herbert Hoover's chief biographers, recent. Uh, Last week, I believe, or maybe it was the week before last, gave a speech at the Miller Center about Herbert Hoover's uh, term in the presidency. And what he pointed out is that there's actually been two parallel histories of the Great Depression really formulated. One by economists, especially folks really focused on the history of monetary policy during that time, and historians, specifically presidential historians. And that if you look at the Milton Friedmans and the Bernanke's, that there's really uh, a, a lot of understanding of what sort of the Fed's deflationary monetary policy did to extend uh, the Great Depression in those years, almost in spite of the efforts made by the federal government, both, both Hoover and the Congress. Uh, but that there's just been this siloing of the sort of faculties, mm -hmm. of sort of the, the historians yeah. and the economists right. Right. on this issue, and that it hasn't really melded or yeah, fused yeah. into the mainstream. Right. And I wonder if any yeah. of you care to comment oh, uh, on that. Robert Waples, W-H-A-P-L-E-S, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, did a study where he polled economic historians years ago about the New Deal. And those economic historians who were historians with a PhD in history by training believed the New Deal was economically good on balance. And those economic historians who were trained economists were less sure. I, I'm, I'm remembering about 50% were less sure. Um, when you get into the economics, whether you think it's monetary or some other area, it's, it's um, easier to blame the government and or the Fed and you come away thinking the market should have been freer. Um, for the end of the, the end of the depression, da as David was speaking, I wouldn't say it was the gearing up for the war because that is also Keynesian spending. I would say it, it, a factor that I discovered in my research was that the government, which was beating up relentlessly upon business, turned away from business and commenced to pour all its energy into rearmament. So the same businessmen who were in court afeared one week, next week were in the White House getting a contract to make a battleship. So all of a sudden, um, the, the, the whole rage of the New Deal went out of the New Deal, the rage at least towards business, and, and went into positive energy building up for the war. And um, you, you want to ask not how did the war end the New Deal, but why did that, uh, sorry, how did the war end the Depression, but why did that Depression last all the way to that war? Sure. I'm going to stop talking now. Steve will do it. Make a um, Bill Nitza with the Committee for the Republic. Um, okay. I would like to ask about three handicaps as I see them to the conservative philosophy which you have eloquently uh, laid out both historically and intellectually. The first handicap relates to Russell Kirk's first principle, divine providence. Now, I was raised as a Christian to regard divine providence as powerful, awesome, all-encompassing, and mysterious, and also was taught to be very careful in associating said providence with any particular human philosophy or project. Now, what has happened politically, as I see it, is that the Republican Party, I'm not saying the conservative movement per se, 
as first in the 30s and 40s in order to give the business community credibility after the popularity of Roosevelt's New Deal created the gospel of prosperity. And it was very successful in terms of repositioning the business community, but I think has a serious downside. Secondly, the Southern strategy that Lee Atwater and others um, developed, uh, Kevin Phillips perhaps initially came up with the idea, um, associated the Republican Party not just with Pentecostal Christianity, but with unfortunate traditions of nativism and racism, which frankly, I think are a handicap to the conservative movement today. Thirdly, the Republican Party, and this perhaps comes out of Texas, perhaps California as well, created its own welfare state. Now in this case, the beneficiaries of said welfare state are not poor people living in area, urban or rural areas. There are various elements of the military industrial national security complex, which have, has been generous to politicians and others. And frankly, whose influence over national policy, I think is not fully consistent with what I would regard as conservative principles. Finally, you referred to Herbert Hoover's love of virtue, and I share that love entirely, and I think it is an integral part of our American cultural tradition going back to our founders, who admired the Roman Republic as it should have been. So I'm a big fan of virtue. The difficulty is the contemporary Republican Party, as an instrument for conservative principles, has what I have described as a huge virtue deficit, both in what it says and what it practices. And until that deficit is overcome, conservatism, in my view, has a huge problem. Anybody wow. care to comment? Virtue deficit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to start? Go ahead, David. Go ahead. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, in my first of all, I'll say Republicans are not conservatives. I'm more interested in discussing the conservative, and you recognize that, Bill. But I, I'm more interested in in sorting out the conservative political philosophy than I am dealing with a particular party or politician's application of it. And I mean, if you just study something like size of government, uh, you know, throughout the the Republicans have not done dramatically better, except for one Reagan term, than the Democrats. So, I mean, so I'm not here to defend uh, Republican applications of these principles. I will say, I, I wrote a column in Forbes a couple weeks ago that I think speaks to your point, and I'll just let it go at this. I said that I'm, I'm growing wary of the adjectives that Republican presidential candidates feel the need to apply to the term, to the noun, conservative. So George W. Bush wanted to be a compassionate conservative, mm -hmm. which I think leads in one set of non-conservative directions, frankly. Ended up, I think, after 9-11 being more of a neo-conservative, another set of challenges to conservatism. John McCain wanted to be a maverick conservative, uh, which in my first draft I wrote, as far as I could tell, just meant grumpy. But I, <laughs> I, I deleted that. Um, then uh, Mitt Romney, who in my view was a businessman, was not really a conservative philosophically, was a pragmatic businessman, nevertheless tried to sell himself as severely conservative, which I don't think anybody really bought. Milton Friedman famously said, you know, businessmen are for free markets in theory, but always appreciate a little regulation or subsidy in their own particular line of business. Now, uh, apologies to reform conservatives in the room, but Jeb Bush, you know, the leading candidate for 2016, says he's a reform conservative. <laughs> I don't even read that as being like the philosophy being developed by some of the young reform conservatives today. I think for Jeb Bush, it's a bit more of a big government form of conservatism. So to me, that's the problem <clears throat> is that these Republican candidates, and I think it'd be a very interesting question that maybe our next panel would address. Why are they afraid to just be conservatives? I mean, do they think that doesn't sell anymore? Do they think there's not a constituency for that? Why do they feel the need for these adjectives, which I think, I agree with the tenor of your question, by and large lead away from conservatism, not strengthening of conservatism? 
I just, just briefly, I would say that the conservative movement started out as an intellectual movement, um, whether you want to begin. And I, I think that's the reason why I begin with, with Kirk, because I'm looking at in terms of that. There were certainly earlier uh, applications through, uh, from Mr. Hoover and also from, from Coolidge as well. So beginning as an intellectual movement, then becoming a political movement with Goldwater and Reagan, and then finally becoming, as I say, a governing majority under Reagan. The philosophy undergirding each one of those transformations shifts and changes depending upon the situations. Uh, it was good for Goldwater to be the, the all-out libertarian that he was in 1964. Uh, given that he didn't have a chance of winning, he wanted to stake out some philosophical positions to begin to get people to realize what conservative ideas were. But Reagan then said, well, I'm not going to run on the same kind of, of, of campaign platform that Goldwater did. Um, and I think that uh, not being rigid is one of the uh, strengths of the, of the conservative movement, that it is not a ideology not an ideology, but as a philosophy. It is a philosophy, and so you, you, can, you can give and take, you can add and subtract, still keeping faith you know, with certain principles, including the, the Constitution, but shifting and changing as needed. Reagan was good at that, and that's the one reason why he did all that he was able to do in that. It's one of the reasons why uh, people like uh, George W., Got, got carried away with spending, you know, crazily as he did uh, because he got too far away. It's the give and take of politics which is so difficult and demands leadership principled, uh, grounded in principle. He has a follow -up. Uh, Dave, let me at least put in a, a pitch that there is a place in the world for grumpy cons. I'm trying to actually start that as an identifiable movement uh, sect on our side. Uh, I was thinking about, uh, it has copped up a couple of times now, uh, Amity's challenge to Lee about did Goldwater ever cite Hoover or Coolidge? And I went, I just quickly, because we can do that now with all these smart things we've got, right? I looked up the convention speech, which I recall correctly, is kind of a synoptic history of the Republican Party and the philosophy of the Republican Party. But he only mentions two people by name, Lincoln and Eisenhower. So he skips over Theodore Roosevelt and obviously Hoover and Coolidge. Um, and who else was there? I mean, McKinley, I guess. You can throw in a few others. Uh, Harding, I suppose. Uh, but on the other hand, if you think about it for a minute, um, think about even in the 50s and the 60s, and then separate the two people. Hoover's the person the Democrats ran against forever. We don't want to go back mm -hmm. to Hoover, do we? Right. We want to go back to that ruin. Hoover the same course. way we like to keep Jimmy Carter handy on our side, right? Because he's, he's a perennial, right? Um, and, and then, uh, but then Silent Cal. I've always thought there was something wrong with that if you actually read his speeches. Last American president to write his own speeches, right? Uh, an extremely thoughtful man who actually did pick arguments with progressives. He actually, some of his speeches can be seen as a debate with Woodrow Wilson, who he doesn't name. Uh, and so why would you call him silent? Well, he's taciturn, but I think, I, I think the liberal historiography, and remember, by the way, Margaret Hoover, the most academic historians are economically illiterate, right, when they're not actively bad, right? Well, all those histories that came out in the 50s and 60s of the New Deal era, Schlesinger, John Hicks, Luchtenberg, go through all of them. They're not only economically illiterate, but their overwhelming point was to uh, disparage Hoover and Coolidge together in Harding. The whole decade of the 20s was unremitting failure and short-sightedness. And where were the, the, you know, Amity wasn't along. There weren't any defenses yet uh, by anybody. Um, and so, on one hand, the, the liberal historians, I think, they wanted to call him Silent Cal because they didn't want anyone to actually ever read what he said, because it was actually pretty good. Hoover, he could run against in straight politics, just what the record was, even if you distort it, and then throw that in with a fog of ignorance. Um, and so it's, uh, it's not surprising to me that, uh, uh, you know, Nixon, it's really not till Ronald Reagan comes along that Reagan openly praises Coolidge, right? And then the famous, you remember the ruckus, he put Coolidge's picture up in the cabinet room right. and official Washington erupts in outrage and incredulity, right? Um, and that was fun, right? Yeah. But uh, I think it's actually that simple why he's not quoted, um, but I think it's worth looking for, Lee. I'll, I'll yeah. join in that hunt. I, I, uh, I just want to ask Mr. Nidzi what he meant by virtue. 
or I could get I could guess, but but. Well, yeah, I'm you. I'm using the Roman Republic in the same way that George Washington did when he put on uh, that play by Addison Cato at Valley Forge. Um, Cato preferred to die and be killed by Julius Caesar's agents rather than to allow a single man to assume a dictatorship over the Roman Republic. Now that was the same philosophy that Brutus had with Tarquin. And <clears throat> it's that idea. No, well, um, this actually relates to what Steve was saying about uh, Coolidge being the first to write his own speech. Um, and the absence of virtue now, um, I, I see it in two ways, the way you just described, but also this sort of um, attack dog attitude of Republican parties, uh, of the Republican Party. Our big problem is that the candidates are too much dominated by spinmeisters. And the spinmeisters tell them what to say and they get befuddled. I think we saw that with Paul, Paul Ryan. And they don't turn to their inner principle and write what, what they believe or say what they believe or certainly write their own speeches. And the voters know that. Uh, so so th th then the Republican candidates become inconsistent because they are more managed than true. And uh, the Democratic candidates have this problem too. And, and one strength of Coolidge's and I think Hoover's was they, they um, thought to themselves, what shall I say? And then they say it. Uh, and go on whatever the consequences um, and stand for the republic whenever they can, whatever the consequences, virtue. All right. Um, I permitted a question of Amity about her book on Coolidge. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, in your book, you raise the tension between Calvin Coolidge and his then Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover believed in dams and publicly funded infrastructure to an extent hmm, that almost rivaled Stalin. Remember those wonderful? <laughs> and the result of this love affair between Herbert Hoover and federally funded infrastructure created Cadillac Desert and created a situation where market forces were overridden. I mean, the price of water has been uh, federally subsidized to a vast extent for three generations now. We have created cities where cities should not have been, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the irony is that that plus the military industrial complex created whole communities of people in agriculture, defense industries, and elsewhere that are now loyal supporters of the modern Republican Party. Now, can you comment on this history from a Coolidge perspective? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, um, it's important to know that Coolidge had a dam, and our colleague Rashad Thomas went to it. Um, he wasn't too I, I uh, probably concerned about the way that it was built and who paid for it, but he did have one, and it, it, it had a lot of grass growing behind it. And the humorous Will Rogers said, if that were my lake, I would mow it. Second panel, which is going to be not the roots of modern American conservatism, but the future of modern American conservatism. My name is Margaret Hoover, and I'm associated here with the Hoover Institution. I'm a, a, on the Board of Overseers. and. Uh, Wrote, wrote a book about a little bit of this, uh, American Individualism, a title punked from my great-grandfather Herbert Hoover on his piece that David Davenport referenced in the last panel, American Individualism. But mine is how a new generation of conservatives can save the Republican Party. Even though we don't talk parties here, we're talking about the movement. And we have three distinguished contributors to the movement to discuss the future of the conservative movement. Um, first, immediately to my right is James Caesar, who is from the University of Virginia, but also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, has written several books on American politics and American political thought, uh, Presidential Selection, Reconstructing America. You all can read his robust biography in the pamphlet, and we look forward to your comments. And Diana Firchgoth Roth, did I get it right? Who is the director of E21 at the, and a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and writes for Tax Notes and Market Watch, and has been on the staffs of both the George W. Bush Administration's Council on Economic Advisors, where she was the chief of staff, as well as also contributing to uh, the Domestic Policy Council, and also serving in uh, uh, President H.W. Bush's 
uh, Council of Economic Advisors and President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. So the CEA is your home away from home. Uh, and then um, somebody who, you know, some might say has really reinvigorated the model of, of Bill Buckley himself by becoming this, this sort of uh, really concentrator of new conservative minds and thinkers, Yuval Levin, through his publication at National Affairs, uh, which is really one of the go-to places where if you, if you don't like the name, the, 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 the adjectives that describe conservatives, where, maybe where the reformicons go, or has been called the reformicons. Just conservatives. I totally they're, they're, they're robust conservatives. They're robust conservatives, but has uh, really reinvigorated with a new generation of, of voices and ideas um, that, that adhere and hew to, to those same conservative principles. Um, so we'll have each of our panelists begin with some remarks, and then we'll have a Q&A section like we did in the last panel. Um, James. Uh, thanks, Margaret. As you mentioned, the first panel was uh, on roots, and it rested on the firm and solid ground of history, where facts count a lot, whereas this panel floats on a shifting sea of the unknowable, <laughs> where speculation abounds. <laughs> Only prophecy could really foretell the future. But alas, this profession is filled today, even more so than at the time of uh, the great Jeremiah, with false prophets, who, as he said, invent specious signs, speak of naught, and have hearts of deceit. In other words, so many of our pollsters, political commentators, and consultants. Yet, uh, lo, on my train trip this morning, a vision appeared unto me, hazy as if behind a veil. <laughs> I saw a grandstand in front of the White House on a cold day in January 1917. There I could just glimpse the figure of the new president reviewing the inaugural parade. A Republican he was, though I could not see if he was pale as if from Wisconsin or tan as if from Florida or whether he was tall or short. But yea, it seemed for sure that he was not from New Jersey. <laughs> and I saw all the great paying their respects, the Speaker of the House of Representatives and a majority leader from the Senate, they too Republicans. And I saw the mighty men and women governors, at least one score and a dozen more who were Republicans, and the legions yes, the legions of Republican state legislators, shivering, but smiling and waving. And then I heard a voice, and it said, look 200 days thence, and speak of the spirit and mood of these same then. Prophesize and tell us what they will be saying after they have had the chance to govern. And then suddenly and abruptly, the vision ceased. And the voice I heard was not from afar, but came loudly and brutally in my ear. Next stop, Culpepper, <laughs> Culpepper, Virginia. So left to my own uh, meager devices uh, and set on that sea of speculation, I could only ask a couple of questions. Will conservatives, one year or so into that term of governance, be commending themselves for a record that they can boast is firm and intelligent and filled with reforms? coupled though with a mood which is sought to minimize polarization and create consensus? Or will conservatives be celebrating, though inevitably with trepidation, a huge break, a transformation from the status quo, akin in scope to the New Deal or the Great Society, a kind of revolution larger than that of President Reagan, who had no majority? something that could be accomplished on the aims or ends of what Mrs. Thatcher did when she inaugurated the new right. No wets, but the new right. Something that, even without a cheap intent to provoke, would nonetheless truly rile the opposition, bring it to the streets, excite cries of being radical, and create polarities. Now, each option could plausibly claim to be conservative. The first could speak of conservative virtue, of going slow, of seeking continuity, of cultivating harmony. Such conservatism, one might say, could quote some line or two from Edmund Burke, 
about partnership of the dead and the living and the yet to come, and so on and so on and so on. And not to disparage this uh, position, but one can be sure that it would be supported by some on the left who like not only to display their erudition, yes, we read Burke too, but also to give instruction to conservatism about conservatism. This instruction always seeks to tame and domesticate conservatism, such it does so it won't threaten the gains of progressivism. Conservatism of this kind is permitted into the great manor house of progressivism on agreement that it must remain polite and will not threaten the master. The section, second option can also claim to uh, be conservatism, but understood now less as view or pace or speed that is going slow, but more instead as a direction of set ideas, a direction that also considers the context in which action takes place. But what about Burke? Well, the answer might be, read him. You can rest assured that if British champions of French doctrines had ever won power and in a brief time upset his beloved British constitution, he and fellow conservatives on return to power would not have hesitated to use the pike and cudgel to these transformers. Anyhow, Burke was not an American. Two weeks ago, I spent a day or two at CPAC, and I never heard his name mentioned. In speaking of the mood or spirit of conservatism, I've said nothing at all about the content of the measures. But the spirit all by itself can influence some things about strategy. Conservatism, I know, in any case, is sure to promote the Constitution. But in respect to sub-constitutional matters, a spirit of deep transformation would suggest a high-risk strategy, a high-risk approach that conservatives normally would not take. Thus, it would be time to consider the nuclear option, not, as with progressives, for Iran, but for the termination of the 60-vote rule in the Senate. And it goes without saying that while conservatives would want to cease and desist from executive legislation, they would reserve the right during the first year to undo all executive matters relating to the executive legislative measures undertaken by this president. Conservatives are constitutionalists, but not chumps. But now, in a more speculative spirit, it's necessary to ask whether the vision of Republican victory for the presidency in 2016 may not be an illusion. Surely everyone can see that the practical part of conservatism in the future depends greatly on the outcome of this election. Another four or eight years in which a substantial reform progressivism was in charge would have to alter the practical program of conservatism. Much of the future, therefore, rests on the contingency of the outcome of this election. Conservatives of most stripes were in, found themselves in some kind of panic after the 2012 election. Time and again, we heard them lament that the Republican Party had lost the popular vote in five of the last six national elections. That when the American people had a chance to choose between two great visions, they have chosen the progressive vision, and so on and so on. Some of these laments went so far as to claim that the Republican Party and conservatism was but a, a rump movement now, consigned forever to minority status. Now, the outcome of the 2014 elections lifted spirits somewhat. How could it not? But it still left many with roughly the same conclusion as after 2012 for the presidential election. Those who panicked, or who feigned panic after 2012, either called for the party to change immediately its appeal, to accommodate itself to a new electoral strategy, or else they sought to instrumentalize the loss of 2012 so that the Republican Party could be saved only by adopting the particular strand of conservatism they favored. All this analysis was mixed up and confused in practice. But here were some of the conclusions regularly drawn after the election. The Republican Party and conservatism was finished unless it adopted comprehensive immigration reform now. 
The Republican Party was finished unless it became the pre progressive party light and offered some of the same things as the progressives, only more effectively. Or the Republican Party was finished unless it stopped um, nominating Republican in name only candidates and put forward a real conservative. All this discussion was nice, and a party that wants to win will always have to consider electoral realities and recalibrate some of its messages to build a majority. But this whole mode of reasoning is about 70% flawed. In modern American politics, presidential elections are for the most part lost, not won. A president will lose if his record is deemed sufficiently poor to make a change. An incumbent party's president candidate will lose if the record of the president's governance is considered sufficiently poor. Add perhaps a small premium in favor of a itch to change after a party has been in power for two or three terms. This is the great law of presidential elections, which realistically determines most of the outcomes. But it does mean that the search for the winning coalition and building a winning coalition does not determine in advance the chance of a party to win. A winning coalition, in truth, is built after you have won office and convinced certain groups that they can change to your side. So what about 2016? Here as well, we still know so little. Compared to 2012, progressives could be far less vulnerable on what they have done for the economy. On the other hand, they are uh, far, uh, far more vulnerable on matters of judgments of sheer competence of governance. Combined with shocks on medical care and insurance costs, the incompetence of government could loom large in the 2016 election. And so could accumulations of governance and lawful, unlawfulness in the governing process. Many say, though for sure it's too soon to say for certain, that 2016 will be a foreign policy election in which domestics is secondary. This is by no means certain either. But one thing at least is clear. The progressives are now 10 to 20 to 30 times more exposed or vulnerable on foreign affairs than they were in 2012 when it worked in their advantage. Any further important crisis that comes to the fore and shows us doing poorly will have disastrous effects on the Democratic Party. They will have no way to escape. So no trends, in my view, or democratic, demographic factors are as important for the future as which party wins the next election and has a chance to govern. That contingent fact is the greatest shaper of the immediate future for practical conservatism. If one insisted for a moment on speaking of that part of the equation that operates independently of voter assessments of performance, I concede a little bit with the pessimists that progressives have a slight advantage structurally or demographically. Their structural advantage stems from the obvious fact they, they promise more benefits to more people than conservatives. Indeed, they have already done so for so many that conservative governments would leave many toler uh, terrified in advance. There are more and more people who think and think correctly that even if things might get better generally for the country under conservative governments, and who knows that for sure, but even if it would get better generally under conservative governments, they would get worse for me. Some benefit might be taken away, such as the lock that the progressives has sought to put on the American electorate. When it comes to targeted government promises of benefits, the conservatives can never outpromise the progressives. Add to this that at the national level, conservatives cannot promise a reduction of taxes to huge portions of the electorate anymore because huge portions pay no taxes. And there you see the progressive structural advantage. Conservatives, more than progressives, need to win in order to win, to show others by experience that things get better under their policies. And that is what is happening in a few of the states. Two minutes? Um, 
Well, I wanted to say a whole thing about conservative ideas, but they're not worth very much for the time <laughs> being. I hope I'll have a chance to develop those. Uh, can we do that in two minutes? Oh, I, I can do it uh, yeah, quickly. Okay, I'll say a few things about this. Uh, um, well, what is the future of conservative ideas? Um, I, I think it's proper, even from what we saw this morning, to speak of conservatisms rather than conservativism. We saw that conservatism, as it was put together, was already a fusion of different ideas that didn't sit well with each other. In a sane world without progressives, the conservative movement would split up into different parties. But the world is not sane. Conservatism, therefore, can say correctly and proudly that it is mostly a, uh, a movement against something, against the progressive project, a progressive project that believes in centralized control, enlightened administration, administered by experts, democratic plebiscit, uh, plebiscitory means of choosing the government. Almost everything else will be jettisoned to those ends. Rights will be jettisoned. The Constitution will be jettisoned. Local governments and federalism will be, get, will jet, will be jettisoned. Separation of powers will be jettisoned. It is that goal at all that drives progressivism to the core. Conservatives favor other things. Progressivism is a philosophy of government. Conservatism is a philosophy of government and of civil society. Civil society was discovered by conservatives. So when you look at rule, it's, uh, for the progressives, it's all government. For the conservatives, it includes elements of society, family, religion. Lower levels of government are all part of conservatism. And then I'll conclude with a quick list of, uh, I, I'm being silenced? <laughs> <laughs> they paid for this microphone. Who paid for this? <laughs> I can shout for the last. Cry out, please. No wonder conservatives have doubts about technology. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I just wanted to say what I thought, a, a quick list of what the, the principles that conservatives share, different types uh, in different degrees. But here they are. The nation. Nation's essential, I think, to conservative way of thought, putting the nation first. Liberty. Liberty understood in all sorts of different ways, but especially against an all-powerful central point where all decisions would be made in the hands of one. Responsibility, or virtue, if you want to use a sophisticated term, on the understanding that liberty can't be successfully practiced without restraints. Most of these come from governance of civil society, but politics, especially local politics, has a role. And then maybe a controversial one, but I think necessary. Action for the public welfare. It's an error, I think, that conservatism has no place for action for the public welfare, for prosperity, the general good. But this part, limited more than others, placed more at the federal and local level than at the, the, the national level. And finally, uh, in conservative thought, always thinking of what the ends of liberty and the system are for, not just to have liberty, but for some higher good. And pronounced always as a plurality of higher goods, hence the the notion of the plurality of goods rather than a single model is what I think differentiates modern conservatism from classical ideas. And you can put those uh, under the name of different cities. It used to be said Athens as one, philosophy and the nobility of philosophy, the liberal arts and education. Jerusalem, another, the importance of uh, biblical religions and probity. Then we have to add the other two. Rome, which speaks of another kind of virtue, including a uh, military virtue, and finally Glasgow, which speaks of the importance of individual human beings using their freedom to create things for this world as a high and honorable aim. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you. Diana, first back row. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of you for coming and listening. It's great to be here. I want to thank Hoover and the Coolidge Foundation for putting this on. Uh, and uh, 
I know that Hoover is going to have a very successful and widening footprint uh, here in Washington, D.C. Well, we've heard a lot today uh, about progressives and also about conservatives. And what I'd like to do is talk about the message today of both of them. Nothing in the Democrats' agenda, nothing in the progressives' agenda, and by the way, I don't think they should be called progressive, uh, nothing offers people a better future. What Democrats are saying is that we'll make sure you don't die. We'll give you Obamacare. We'll make sure you don't die. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, you can eat. We'll give you food stamps. We'll make sure you can have all the sex you want without penalty. We'll give you free contraceptives and free abortions. But we're not giving you any path to be better off. And saying that we're going to help you be just fine and survive is no message for people who want to be better off. They want to have upward mobility. They want to progress. That's why the message of we're going to look after you isn't as strong as the conservative's message, which is we are going to make you better off. We are going to enable you uh, to grow, to get richer, to have more children, uh, to have those houses, those McMansions that you want out in the suburbs, uh, as opposed to the, quote, progressives, unquote, who want to do away with those McMansions. We can tell people, and our policies can help people be better off. And that's what we have to hammer away at them. Now, let's look at taxes, for example. They want to raise taxes. We want to lower taxes. Lowering taxes encourages people to uh, work. It encourages businesses to invest. We all know the academic literature that says that, ta that countries with low taxes do better. There have been multiple indices of economic freedom. The Heritage Index is one example. There are numerous others that show that countries that spend less and have lower taxes have faster economic growth. And that's, as we all know, because lower taxes encourage people uh, to work because they get to spend more of their money. So lower taxes makes people better off. That's part of our platform, not theirs. Giving states more flexibility in numerous ways. Uh, I've written a paper here. I've brought a few copies uh, about uh, which, which is, this one's called Welfare in America from 1998 to 2013. There's copies available on the Manhattan Institute website, and I brought a few here. If we were to combine all the welfare programs, uh, such as food stamps and Medicaid uh, and uh, TANF, and we were to give them to the states, and we were to say to the states, we are going to increase the amount we are giving you with inflation and with the number of people below poverty in your states. Uh, and other than that, this is up to you to give out. If we'd done that in uh, 1998, we would have saved about $1.3 But now, with, the, with Washington doling out all these different programs, first of all, it gives states no opportunity to see where their needs are. And secondly, it expands the costs. And expanding the costs means we need higher taxes. And it means uh, that people have more uh, taken out of their budgets uh, with these taxes. So we need to give states flexibility. There have been very good examples with Medicaid, for example, in Rhode Island, uh, in Indiana, of programs that cover more people at a lower cost. <laughs> With food stamps, with money coming from Washington, we can hear advertisements in these different states to get more welfare payments. In Maryland, I can hear it with children crunching carrots and saying, Mommy, these carrots are so good. Sign up for food stamps so we can get more carrots. And of course, the incentive is for states to get as much as possible from Washington, because that boosts their own economies. Once we give the states the money and say, you can use this as you want. And by the way, if there's any left over, you can spend it on infrastructure or anything else you want. That will enable them to cut the costs and better target these programs at people who need. School choice. I think school choice is something where, uh, where conservatives have a big advantage. We have an advantage because what we want to do is enable better education for all these children. Progressives are saying that unions have to have a major voice in education, a major voice on keeping unqualified teachers, as they do in New York in rubber rooms. Uh, Bobby Jindal in Louisiana 
uh, has done a superb job in New Orleans with charter schools. Those enable money to follow the child. If a school isn't good, then the parent can take the child out and put in another school. This is an example of helping people be better off. We want to help people be better off. We don't want to protect the older, unqualified teachers uh, the way the Democrats do. Uh, let's look at regulatory reform. Democrats have a major problem in that a large part of their base are environmentalists. And environmentalists want to slow economic growth. So not only have they prevented President Obama from taking the mostly symbolic act of approving the Keystone XL pipeline, they're also in the process of expanding regulations on ozone, mercury, power plants, uh, carbon, all of which is going to come at the expense of jobs. They're going to make states craft what's called state implementation plans. Now, those state implementation plans that have to be approved by the Environmental Protection Agency are not plans to implement greater growth. No, far from it. They are plans that force states to reduce the number of factories, reduce the number of power plants, to basically curtail economic growth. And all for what? We don't need energy independence anymore with wind and solar. We have energy independence with natural gas. It's not going to help climate change or global warming for people who believe that global warming is man-made, because the United States now is responsible for only 16% of global emissions. And those emissions are falling rather than rising. We can cut out all the factories and all the power plants in the United States. And it's not going to make one bit of difference in practice to greenhouse gases and emissions. What we have to do if we want to help global warming is help other countries, such as China and India and other emerging economies, cut back on their emissions by helping them use natural gas power instead of the wood burning and coal that they're doing right now. But it's Democrats who are in the thrall of these environmentalists because they depend on them for campaign contribution. In the way of environmental policy, our air is getting cleaner every single day without us doing one more thing about it. You can just look at the EPA website and look at the emissions of individual uh, kinds of pollutants. Uh, but everything the Democrats want to do in this area is making people poorer rather than richer. And here we have the edge on them. If we look at the Affordable Care Act, this is another way that the Democrats say, we are going to help you. But in practice, it means that people's premiums have gone up. They've skyrocketed. And plus, young people's premiums are going up a lot more than premiums on average because they're having to subsidize older people, such as me. This is something where we can be helping. We can be uh, helping people have better choice, have lower premiums so that they have more money to spend on their own uh, things that they want to buy. And I had an op-ed with Grace Marie Turner in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, uh, giving a suggestion for how to allow the 34 states that might be affected by King versus Burwell, the decision that the Supreme Court is going to rule on in June. Uh, if the Supreme Court rules for King over Burwell, it means that premium subsidies that are now being illegally implemented in 34 states are all going to disappear. That means the exchanges are going to break down, and there's going to be no employer mandate and no individual mandate. This is going to force President Obama to sign some modifications in the Affordable Care Act. And here is where Congress and conservatives can step in with a better option. The option we proposed is, first of all, that Congress should allow people to keep the premium subsidies they have received. Second, extend them to the end of the year and allow them to keep them legally, because one cannot disrupt insurance programs in the middle of the year. And then move on to allowing states to take their own pot of money from the premium subsidies that they would have received uh, under Obamacare, and use it however they want. Use it for whatever plan has been approved by state regulators. Uh, and do away with the employer mandate. Now, there might be some technical problems in this, because in practice, if these 34 states do not have a right to these premiums, something called the CBO baseline will be altered. 
In other words, uh, the amount of spending that CBO is allowed to authorize will go down. But uh, conservatives do have a role in providing uh, health insurance uh, and uh, subsidies to health insurance. We do have a role in the safety net, but what we want to do is keep our interference to a minimum so that states have more options and also people have more options. That they're not forced to buy a large plan with things they don't necessarily need, such as pediatric dental care for people who don't even have children, maternity care. Even men have to have maternity care on uh, their uh, insurance programs. Uh, finally, exporting oil and liquid natural gas. How many more minutes do I have left? Finally, exporting oil and liquid natural gas. This is something that Democrats are against because they believe that if we don't use this oil and liquid natural gas, it's going to stay in the ground. But we can have vast benefits from exporting it to different parts of the world. And here's where we can help not just ourselves, because we would benefit from the jobs. We benefit from this energy development. If it hadn't been for the energy development during the recession, uh, we would have had even uh, a worse recession. Our growth would have been even slower than it is right now. And right now, it's only plodding along at 2.2, 2.4%. Not enough to keep all the jobs, not enough to produce all the jobs that Americans need. But we can have vast geopolitical effects if we export our liquid natural gas and oil to places like Russia, which are right now holding uh, the rest of the Baltic countries and some of Europe in a chokehold. And there was a reference, Mr. Nietzsche, who looks like uh, uh, he's taking notes very assiduously over there. He talked about the military industrial complex. But we believe that there are certain goods that can be provided by the private sector and certain goods that cannot be provided by the private sector. And military spending and the whole use of our military is something that it's very difficult for the private sector to provide. We can have private militias and private police departments in some areas. But in terms of the defense of our country, that really is a role for the government. And by using the export, the export of oil and liquid natural gas, uh, we can help our position. We can help hit Vladimir Putin where it hurts, in his pocketbook. And it means that we don't have to uh, have as much spending as we would have otherwise for our military, even though it is very important that we have a strong military, as we can see by what's going on in the world around us when we pull back from that military role. So with that, I'd like to say that conservatives have a positive role to play. We can help make people better off. We're not just saying to them, as the Democrats did in that Julia video, we're going to look after you from cradle to grave. We can say we're going to help make you better off uh, from uh, cradle to grave. We're going to help you uh, earn more money. We're going to help you uh, have more families. We're going to help you with whatever you want to do. Thanks very much. Yaval. Well, thank you very much. My uh, thanks to Hoover and to the Calvin Coolidge Foundation for bringing us together, for inviting me to be part of it. Um, you've arranged this in just the way that conservatives ought to, which was we've started from roots, and we're trying to build our vision of the future uh, on those roots. And I, I'm very privileged to be part of that, and especially given the company here today. So what can we say about the future or the prospects of American conservatism? I feel good on the whole about the prospects of conservatives because of what we have to offer the 21st century. And I want to say a few words about what that is and a few words about America in the 21st century and suggest why you should be hopeful too, but not exactly optimistic, which is not the same as hopeful. Um, hopeful means this could go well, but optimistic means it just should. So sit back and enjoy. Let's not do that. Um, I think it's worth, first of all, remembering what stands between the roots that we uh, looked at and the future that we're here to talk about now. Our discussion of roots uh, ended more or less with Barry Goldwater. Um, and between the Goldwater era and the future we're here to look at, there was a period that included, among other things, uh, some examples of relatively conservative governance at different levels of government. Uh, with some great successes and also some less successful moments, and I think we can learn from all of those. Thinking about those, about the way the conservative movement has developed, might help us see, I think, for one thing, that constructive change generally doesn't come 
in sudden breaks and cataclysmic turning points, but rather through the kind of gradual long-term work of persuasion and negotiation and talking to the public and getting people accustomed to what it is we have to offer. In the Obama era, I think that we conservatives may have too often placed our hopes in catastrophe, uh, in the notion that some event, a fiscal disaster or a monetary disaster or a cultural apocalypse was going to force the country to come to its senses and set things right again. It, it's easy to see why we've inclined to this, because we're living in a catastrophe, and we have reason to hope that things might uh, turn well after it's over. But catastrophes don't usually work that way, and more likely a, a collapse or a disaster or a cultural apocalypse would uh, send the country into the arms of people with very bad ideas. Uh, we won't win by hastening disaster, I think, but by appealing to the public's powerful sense that America could be doing a lot better than it is, uh, and by showing how conservatism's understanding of what our country can be at its best could help us to achieve that. Uh, we have been a little too cataclysmic lately in reaction and in defense. We have a president whose vision of his role and whose behavior in the job have had very little to do with uh, our system of government as we understand it, and we're alarmed at the consequences of that uh, overreach. But I think that in order to stop that overreach and in order to reverse the advances that the left has made and make advances of our own, we're going to have to persuade the general public that we have something better to offer. And as both a political and an intellectual matter, it seems to me the future of American conservatism depends heavily on whether we can turn to that task. We need to think again about how to present an attractive vision of a revitalized American system to the public in ways that will make it clear that it would be better for all Americans, as Diana suggests, not, uh, not, not only in principle, though in principle, but also in practice. That means honing our understanding, for one thing, of the challenges that the country faces and applying our principles, the long-standing principles of the American Republic, to those problems and offering the public a clear, persuasive case that conservatives offer better solutions, that these will lead to greater prosperity, to more freedom and more options, more opportunities for everyone that limited government is better government and makes possible a better society. It's a, a little odd to step back and think about it, but that is not exactly the argument we've been making to the public in the last few years. I think in some respects that means re-emphasizing our long-standing priorities, a doubling down, especially when it comes to the conservative economic message. The left wants to divide the pie according to its priorities. The right wants to grow it and let people set their own priorities. That means growth remains foremost. Growth means tax reform that emphasizes growing the supply of labor and capital available to the economy and relieving the burden of taxation wherever we can. Growth means regulatory reform and trade and fiscal policy that reduces the burden of public spending and the drag of public debt. The conservative message has to start with growth. But I think the conservative message, especially given our sclerotic liberal welfare state, then also has to talk about the ways in which the left's approach to problems has made some of our country's core challenges more difficult, and how and why a conservative approach to solving problems would do better. If all we say to the public is that we oppose the left's agenda, or we think it costs too much, we could easily be misunderstood as calling for the liberal welfare state at a lower cost, uh, f calling for a little bit less of the same. And that is not what we're calling for. What we're calling for is a different vision of American life and the role of government than the one the left has pursued now for coming on a century. A vision rooted in very different views about the human person, about the nature of society, the limits of knowledge and power, the role of government. And so I want to think about that difference very briefly. The left tends to champion public programs that consolidate the application of technical expertise, that try to take on social problems by managing large portions of society as if they were systems in need of better organization and direction. Liberals want to take the power out of the space between the individual and the state, the space that's occupied by families, by civil society, by religious and civic institutions, by the market economy, and give that power to the state so it can organize things better. The right tends instead to champion public policies that draw on decentralized, dispersed knowledge by empowering and incentivizing people nearest to the problem to find and apply solutions that work for them. This is about creating the circumstances in which society can thrive and improve, not prescribing everyone's place and function. It proceeds not through the concentration of power, but through the dispersal of power. So the right wants to put more power into that space between the individual and the state. 
to empower society rather than to manage it. In practice, as a matter of policy, the conservative approach to public policy, therefore, points toward putting in place programs that can enable in different ways a kind of bottom-up, incremental, continuous learning process, rather than imposing confident, wholesale solutions from above. Generally speaking, this is an approach to problem solving that involves three kinds of steps. Experimentation, allowing different kinds of service providers to try different ways of solving a problem. Evaluation, if allowing consumers or recipients of benefits to choose what works for them and what doesn't. And evolution, which just means keeping what's working and throwing away what's not. It seems awfully simple, but government programs on the model of the liberal welfare state don't allow for any of those steps to happen. Administrative centralization and regulation prevent experimentation. Beneficiaries of services generally are not the ones who decide what's working and what's not working. And nothing ever goes away because interests grow around every program and we just keep voting for failure knowing that it's failure year after year. Markets, on the other hand, are ideally suited to following these steps. They offer a huge incentive to try new ways of doing things. The people directly affected decide what works best for them. And what's, what's rejected as a failure is left behind. And that's why conservatives often reach for the model of markets, or you might say the language of markets, in public policy. Not necessarily actual markets in every instance, but for a process that allows these three sorts of steps to the extent possible in different policy arenas, and so achieves incremental improvements by learning from experience. What people are calling now the conservative reform agenda basically involves moving from the former model to the latter model, from government centralization and management to policy that enables bottom-up experimentation and incremental improvement by letting providers compete and letting consumers choose. That's what school choice is about. That's what the conservative approach to health care is about. It's what conservatives want to do in welfare reform, in higher education, and essentially every other arena. It involves the replacement of some of our antiquated and lumbering mid-20th century, at best, governing institutions to enable a leaner, more responsive 21st century government to help a more complex, more diverse 21st century society solve its problems. Not by rejecting, but precisely by returning to and reanimating the core principles of American government. We can overcome the suffocating lethargy of the progressive welfare state by returning to the principles that allowed Americans to have a good and functional government in the first place. And I, I want to end with a word about why I think the character of 21st century America should make us hopeful that this can work. And so really by thinking about the future of conservatism and of America. Our country is changing. I think the first 15 years of the 21st century have felt so frustrating and so anxious to many people because we're living in a period of transition. And our understanding of that transition has been obstructed some by the heavy nostalgia that hangs over our politics, nostalgia for mid-20th century America. It's an understandable nostalgia because there was a lot to like about that America. It had a very unusual combination of social cohesion and economic dynamism. But it achieved that combination in very unusual circumstances that can't really be repeated. A lot of our political and intellectual conversation now about the state of the country basically consists of mourning the loss of that mid-20th century America. Robert Putnam just wrote a book of lamentations about it, which I recommend to you. It's an important, interesting book. Charles Murray a few years ago wrote a much better book that, uh, that, that is also, it's a book of charts about how we've changed since 1963, an important question, but not the ultimate question. And Charles gets at what those changes mean and where they take us, but there's a lot on all sides of our politics of thinking about the future by using mid-20th century America as, as our benchmark. A lot of President Obama's economic speeches consist of that, as does, frankly, a lot of what conservatives have to say, especially about the culture but in some respects also about the economy. It's understandable, it's even valuable. We can learn a lot from nostalgia, but too little of it really gets at the ways that the country has been changing, at what new opportunities we might have alongside the no doubt serious challenges that we have. And I'd put one key piece of that this way to close. The post-war order in America was dominated by large institutions, big government, big business, big labor, big media, big universities, mass culture, consolidation that was actually very unusual in American history. But in every arena of our national life, or at least everyone except government for now, we are witnessing the replacement of large centralized institutions 
by smaller decentralized networks. Younger Americans are growing up with a profusion of options <clears throat> in every part of life, with far more choice, but also far less predictability and security. Dynamism in our economy is driven increasingly not by economies of scale, but by competitively driven marginal improvements. Not by consolidation at the core, but by diversity at the margins. Our culture also is becoming a sea of subcultures without a mainstream. Sources of information, of entertainment, of education are proliferating all over the place. <clears throat> and I think that the almost total and really quite bipartisan failure of our politics to confront these changes explains a lot of the dysfunction of our government now and a lot of our frustration with it. Successful lives in post-war America involved effectively navigating those large institutions and making the most of the kinds of benefits that they offered. Success in the years to come is going to involve effectively navigating a profusion of smaller networks and options. And a government that wants to help people flourish will need to retool in a pretty dramatic way, focusing more on enabling bottom-up incremental improvements, less on managing top-down centralized systems. Both empowering individuals and offering people security is going to look very different in this period. And conservatives are much better positioned to lead the country in this direction than liberals are. Because as I've suggested, the idea of a bottom-up government for a bottom-up society comes much closer to our vision of how America should work than the left's. Consolidation is at the core of the progressive project. And the kind of decentralization that we're seeing now in America is a huge mortal threat to the basic view of the world that has motivated progressivism for 100 years. It is a much bigger problem for the left than for the right if only the right would see the opportunities as well as the risks of this particular moment. If conservatives can make that argument, both abstractly and concretely, both in terms of principle and policy, can show the public why the longstanding principles of American constitutionalism and democratic capitalism are well suited to helping us overcome the challenges that we face, can help people see how certain concrete market-oriented reforms of our governing institutions can improve their lives, then I do think the future of conservatism and the future of America should be very bright. It's a big if, and it's a big challenge, and it will require the attention and the energy of the entire conservative movement. It'll require intellectual work and political activism. It'll require an applied social and uh, fiscal and economic conservatism. It'll require policy thinking and philosophical argument. As we've seen today, we have a lot to build on in taking on that challenge. And it certainly won't be easy, but as I say, I am hopeful. Dr. Caesar, I just want to go back to something you said right at the beginning about Republicans nuking the filibuster. And the reason I ask, about, uh, ask this question to you is because it seems today we have an innervation of the legislature. Most of their power has been delegated to administrative agencies which are not elected. They exercise this power in a variety of ways. It seems Congress in order to get anything passed, you need 60 votes in the Senate. And that seems like that, that hurdle, in just terms of technical, objective, practical problems, really does create an issue for in implementing conservative policy. So I was just wondering if you could comment on that, and just some of your thoughts on the filibuster in today's political scene. Well, as I said, normally uh, the conservative party would be a, a go-slow party in, in, a, in, a, in a normal world. And that's one uh, aspect of conservatism. But then conservatism also has to look at a situation. If something's bad, if the situation is dire, conservative can be a party of restoration, change, call it what you will. I don't like the word transformation, since that suggests progressivism, but uh, <laughs> deviation from the status quo. So where are we now? We've had three moments of change in the 20th century, which have been the result of uh, accidents uh, uh, that have all worked by uh, accident in favor of the left. That is, the New Deal, which came after the, the uh, Depression. The Depression could easily have happened just as well under a Democratic uh, administration than a Republican administration, but it happened under a Republican administration. Winner, Democrats, no, no uh, uh, blockage at all on their power. After 1964, this was uh, uh, um, alluded to today, the bullet that killed Kennedy gave uh, Johnson this extraordinary majority. And then 2008, uh, the third moment, um, the, the I could say political problems after the Great Recession and the, the dissatisfaction with the, war, the wars in Iraq. All three have benefited the left. 
when is the right going to get its bite at the apple and really be able to have a chance to be a party that governed? It did not achieve that in Ray. It came close in Reagan's first year, but didn't achieve it. So conservatives have to reason in a different way. When the chance come, we've got to take it. And this means bending things that otherwise you might support with risks, not bending the Constitution. I spoke of sub-constitutional measures. And I think the most important one, if the conservatives can get this majority um, this time, in, after 2017, is to use it to the fullest, which is to say seize the moment, use power like it's never been used by a conservative uh, administration on the lines of what the Democrats have done, and take your chances, hoping that by uh, t tremendous changes you can change the game. Call it shock and awe. Can I, can I follow up on that point with a, a comment or a question to the panel? Um, one thing that we haven't spoken about explicitly in this conversation in the previous panel or this panel is really the, um, when we define the conservative movement, we said, well, it's an idea. But, but what we all know is that it's really a family of factions that really came together uh, under the, the masthead of National Review, really with three factions, the anti-communists, the sort of economic liber libertarians or free marketers, and then some traditionalists. That The tent broadened under the Reagan coalition to include Southern evangelical Protestants and neoconservatives. Um, maybe a few others. Um, can you comment, each of you, and Yuval especially, I'd be, be curious, how, how does factionalism or will it play into the future of the conservative movement? Because it seems to me that actually we have had cataclysmic moments, or moments whereby we could do something, where there was clearly a mandate. I think after 9-11, I think George W. Bush had a, a couple of years in there where there was a lot of goodwill where we did some things, maybe a bit of health care reform. I think we passed Medicare Part D. Uh, some conservatives argue we could have done more for education, gone further with education <laughs> reform. Some conservatives argue we, we should have done different things with health care. Uh, and, and Reagan certainly was able to take that mandate and implement more of a conservative governing agenda. Although at, at the time of Reagan, even we had the common thread of anti-communism uniting all of the factions together, which we, we no longer have. So how do each of you see sort of this factionalism in the conservative movement in, in, the, in contemporary terms and moving forward, it playing into our able, ability to govern. Well, I think Grover Norquist, who wrote a book uh, about the Leave, Leave Us Alone Coalition, I think he put it very well that there are all these different factions. There are people who just care about having their guns. There are people who just care about school choice. They don't care about guns. There are people who care about low taxes, and they don't have kids, and they don't have guns. They're the evangelicals. But they all want a smaller government. And so I think that that's how uh, this different factionalism, as you say, can be reconciled. There are a lot of different groups, but uh, they all want more control over their lives. They all want lower taxes. They all want the government to leave us alone. And I think that we can play on that. We can get all these groups together with our different message, because uh, as you've all said, we're not trying to put everybody into one boat. We're not trying to take different systems together like the internet. We're not trying to regulate the internet. We're not trying to regulate health care. We're not trying to have a massive comprehensive immigration bill. Uh, we want a series of, if anything, small changes that's going to leave people as much discretion as possible. I, I would say I, I think there's more to the unity than convenience. Um, and I, I, it's always seemed to me that, that William F. Buckley and Frank Meyer discovered fusionism more than they invented it. There's, there's really a lot that unifies conservatives. And there's a reason that people clump together in politics in general, and that people who agree with one another about what to do about the deficit are also on the same side on how to fix education. It's not a coincidence. And I think it, it comes down, ultimately, to a sense of your expectations of, 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 of what human beings can do. And I do think that conservatives of different kinds often are unified by a limited sense of the potential of applied human power and knowledge, and therefore by a belief in limits in general, by a sense that it's not true that if we just get the right MIT professor to, to design the healthcare system, <laughs> then it really will work. We just got the wrong one last time. That's just not so. And when you say that to conservatives of various sorts, whether they mostly care about guns or they mostly care about uh, the, the economic issues or whether what they know is taxes or what they know is, 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 is culture and religion, when you say that to them, they say, come on, you're an idiot. And 
they agree with one another as a general matter, therefore, about limited government. And they agree also with the idea of government that is implicit and inherent in the American Constitution, which does not trust anyone, does not trust the people, does not trust the experts, does not trust the politicians. The Constitution sets up a system that begins from the assumption, let's say everybody's wrong all the time. Then what? Then what should government look like? And that's yeah. about right. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it seems to me that that leads people to believe in an approach to government that ultimately believes in limits. It still means public policy tries to solve and address certain kinds of problems, but it doesn't close off possibilities. It doesn't try to manage all of society as if society could be managed. And it seems to me different kinds of conservatives have always agreed as a general matter that that's the right approach, that that kind of modesty and that kind of, again, a belief in a bottom-up way of thinking about how to solve problems, you find that all over conservative ideas. It seems to me not as a matter of convenience, but that's what conservatism is, ultimately. That's what holds it together. Steve? Yeah, something you said, you've all prompts a, a, a broad question that requires a short preface. Uh, when I get the opportunity to talk to a, a thoughtful liberal, you know, someone who's not ideologically in the bag, right? I ask them this question. Uh, can you name something that conservatives are right about or partially right about? And I usually get two answers from people like Rui Teixeira or John Halpin at Center for American Progress. They say, conservatives were absolutely right about the family, and we were mistaken on that. I mean, you saw Nick Kristof the other day in the New York Times saying Moynihan was right 50 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Putnam just now, who's very much a man of the left, but who acknowledges an awful lot of things that you and I would say. Uh, the other thing they will sometimes say to varying degrees is conservatives are generally right about kludgeocracy, to use Stephen Tellis's phrase, but mm -hmm. it doesn't cause them to back away from centralized government. It's in their DNA and they can't, but they will kind of sort of acknowledge that that's right. So I want to turn it around to you mm -hmm. and the whole panel, but I'll start with you. Uh, what are liberals right about or partly right about that we should acknowledge and pay attention to and engage? Uh, well, first of all, I'm glad to hear about kludgeocracy because that's a phrase that Steve and I invented and he published in our magazine uh, in National Affairs. Uh, the left did not like that piece as far as I can tell, but clearly you found some that who did and I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, yeah, they, right. They don't want to do about it what we want to do about it. But um, well, I think that I think that one one thing liberals sometimes get right that conservatives sometimes don't is that people do very often value security at least as much as choice. And a lot of the way we talk to the public has to do with the way we think about life ourselves much of the time, which is, you know, the way we want things to work is just to have an utter profusion of options. Let me make every choice. Yeah. And liberals come and say, well, here's health care. Um, and frankly, that appeals to a lot of people. Now, that doesn't mean that we should come and say the same thing, but rather that it's important for us to make it clear that ultimately, even to achieve those goals, even to get more people the kind of economic security they want, what you want is a free economy that produces prosperity. It's a different way of talking about what we want to achieve in different areas of policy uh, than we usually incline to. And I do think that in our rhetoric, we tend to overemphasize the degree to which people actually want an explosion of choice in every, in every part of life. Uh, and you know, in that sense, the left has been pretty smart about talking to the public uh, about making them safe, even though they ultimately can't back up the tongue. Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that the liberals, uh, one thing that the liberals, I think, have been right on is the need for seat belts. When the idea... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, when, when the idea of having mandatory seat belt use first came out, a lot of conservatives said, including Sam Peltzman at the University of Chicago, said this should be optional. If people don't want to wear a seatbelt, they shouldn't have to, and then they get killed in a car accident, and that's their fault, quite leaving aside the fact uh, that society does have to pay uh, the costs of uh, some of their medical care in the accident. But now, a lot of people just automatically wear seatbelts. Kids have been told to wear seatbelts, and fatalities from car accidents are going down. So smoking. I think they were right about uh, seatbelts. How about smoking? Uh, I think that they're also right. I think smoking is a danger to everybody. I think that they are right uh, to try to educate young people uh, against smoking. Another thing I think that they're right about now more uh, in one of the current arguments is uh, immigration. And I've written a paper called Does Immigration Increase Economic Growth? I brought a few copies for people who are interested in it. And I think, yes, immigration does increase economic growth. 
we need more legal visas, both for low-skill people who want to emigrate uh, and for high school people who, high-skill people who want to immigrate, because uh, the skills of Americans, native-born Americans, are in a bell-shaped curve. We don't have a lot of adults without a high school diploma. We don't have a lot, lot of adults with PhDs in math and science. But the skill sets of immigrants are in a U-shaped curve. There are a lot of adults without high school diplomas who want to come here. They want to clean hotels. They want to pick fruit. They want to look after our young people and elderly people. And you rarely meet Americans who want to make that their career. So we want more of these people here. We also want more PhDs in math and science. Uh, they start companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, they make native-born US scientists more productive because they can do some of the backup work. So I think that we really need to focus on having more legal visas uh, to attract these people here to the United States. Seat belts. Next you'll tell me they were right about fluoridation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's been something skipped here in all of this discussion. I, I like this uh, back and forth we've had here in the last few minutes where we're able to rationally assess both sides and say, well, they got that right. Or they, they acknowledge that we got this right. But this kind of discussion can never take place in the public arena because of, to use the shorthand phrase, media bias. Everything that uh, the, the other side says is filtered for clarity. And everything that our side says is distorted for obfuscation, by and large, uh, by the media. And I don't see anything that's, that really can be done to correct that and make a more level debating field, so to speak, on any public. Do you have a question for the panelists? What can we do about that? <laughs> I, I think this is one of the ways that the f fracturing of the American experience actually does have an upside. The power of the mass media it has declined dramatically in our very recent experience and is continuing to do that. Again, we, we tend often to think about the downsides of that, and they're very significant. But the upsides of that are also enormous. And one of the upsides of this kind of, of fracturing of our experience is that people don't just get all their information from one place anymore. And that means it makes sense for us to try to provide information and analysis ourselves. And that means that it makes sense to look for information and analysis in different places. And I think in terms of the power of media bias, we're in a much better place now than we were 20 years ago. And we'll be in a better place in 20 years, I think. Ilya Shapiro from Cato. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I want to pose kind of a, a practical question, which is <coughs> kind of unusual at a, at a think tank where we've been talking about ideas. But let's say we achieve the perfect synthesis of both uh, theory and, and policy proposals of Hoover and Heritage and Cato and the EPC and whoever Manhattan else is Institute. represented here. Manhattan Institute. <laughs> Manhattan Institute, absolutely. Can't leave them out. Bullet. Anyway. <laughs> All of them perfectly synthesized. I think this once gay marriage recedes as an issue, this will be possible. Uh, we, you know, we achieve that, but yet we still face a uh, a demographic change and this media change. And um, you know, if uh, uh, the percentage of white voters, for example, that um, uh, Romney and McCain won, if they had been in an electorate that Reagan faced, they would have easily been elected president, for example to talk about Republicans, if not conservatives. Um, what can we do? I mean, is, is it simply a matter of repackaging the me is just messaging and micro-targeting? Is it, uh, to use Diana's example, to, to, to calibrate the perfect soundbite of we are teaching you to fish, not just giving you a fish sort of thing? Um, or will it just be once we achieve that ideal synthesis, then everything will resonate, uh, whatever the electorate is? It's, it's a great point. I'll just add to that. You know, the millennial generation, which will be 25% of the electorate in the next political election, self-identifies 52% uh, independent, uh, just in terms of core political philosophy, 30-some uh, percent as liberal and 20-something percent as conservative. So do we have a demographic challenge, or how do we confront demographic challenges? I think a lot of the millennials are getting tired of uh, the situation that we're in now. The deck is stacked against these millennials. We're asking them to pay they're, our That's where debt. they're good on conservative ideas. They're good on debt. And they're good on education reform, but on everything else, they don't identify a conservative movement. 
Well, I think that they're starting to realize that, 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 uh, that that's a mistake. They're getting done out of a good education. We're putting a lot of obstacles in their path uh, as far as getting jobs. What we've done in terms of disallowing unpaid internships, occupational licensing so they can't start their own business, uh, raising the minimum wage so they can't get jobs. I think there are a lot more millennials who are going to be voting Republican uh, in the next election than voted in 2008. They've seen the age of Obama. They don't like it. But in terms of uh, minorities coming in, I think that there are a lot of minorities who like the Republican message. They have come from countries where there's no opportunity. They don't like the government taking their tax money. They want better futures for themselves and their children. So I think that our message naturally sells to the changing demographic. I would say, well, first of all, Diana is too modest to say that she's got a wonderful book about the young and politics uh, coming out in May, which you all should read. It's it's a very powerful and important book. What's it called? It's called it's called Disinherited: How Washington Is Betraying America's Young. Um, be, be, I, I would also say that the the concern about demographics uh, can't be foremost for us. It just can't be. Uh, it, you know, if you had looked at the Catholic vote in 1960 and where it was going, you would say the Republican Party would cease to exist around 1980, right? And that didn't happen. What happened instead is that Catholics began to vote for the Republican Party because it began to offer them something that spoke to their concerns and their understanding of their situation. I think that to, to really believe in America as a melting pot is to say that the case we make to different kinds of demographic segments of the nation has first of all got to be the same case uh, and it's got to be a case that believes that our fate at some level is is one. Uh, the The Republican message has not attracted minority voters because it has not been attractive. That's why it hasn't attracted minority voters. The, the, you know, l l listen to what Mitt Romney said to the country, and I had to ask myself, do I really have to vote for him? <laughs> um, there, there is a better way to do this, and it's a better way that ultimately means conservatism, not one or another kind of conservatism, but building on exactly the ideas that we've talked about here. And there is an exceptional unity to these ideas. I mean, what really struck me when, when Amity spoke and in reading her wonderful book about Coolidge is that the emphasis, for example, on civil society and on how society is structured is exactly what 21st century America needs to hear. And sure, it has to be updated. It has to be talked about in the terms of 21st century life. But it is the same message because ultimately it is not a message that's designed for one moment or another. It's a message that's about how human beings thrive in a free society. That still has to be our message. And I don't care what color you are, that's our message to you. James? Well, I'm a, if you take the clock back 20 or 30 years ago, I'm not sure that we um, were wise to have the same immigration policies that we've had. Uh, there's a practical aspect to it. However long it may take for groups to um, change their minds, may come in with a certain disposition, and that certain disposition may uh, last for a long time. So let's get practical about this. Every, everyone knows what happened to the politics of California. The state is gone for Republicans for the time being, and it has a lot to do with the groups that have emigrated there. So that's the short-term problem, and I don't think we should be so um, idealistic uh, as, as not to be able to mention this. But now that we are where we are, as we say, we just have to accept the population as we are, which isn't to say that we should keep making the same mistakes. I think it, it sh there should be some practical uh, point brought to bear about groups and their tendencies uh, to vote as a short-term problem which has electoral impact. That said, um, there's a public discourse that has to appeal to the population that we have. And um, I, I agree with you, Val. I'd go further and say, all this talk about elections, never say, and it isn't true, that uh, Republicans are appealing to a white vote. Minorities are appealed to as minority blocks, openly and directly. That's the way the Democratic Party works. The Republicans, first of all, the whites aren't a, aren't, aren't a block. There are too many of them, I'm, I'm sorry. They don't think in terms of a block yet, or not very much. They think of themselves as people, not as, oh, I'm a white, I'm going to vote this, except maybe in a few places. So stop uh, this little game that the consultants on the left are playing of saying that Republicans are making appeal to, to white voters. Republicans are making appeals to a certain class of voters. And it's true, sociologically, we know that for the time being, this is going to have more appeal to uh, perhaps to white voters than to Hispanics. That may be the fact. But that's irrelevant to the point. The point is to make appeal to a segment of voters that has a certain interest or view. 
and to hope that over time, those who are here and have been disposed sociologically to go in one direction will eventually be drawn to, to, to another, as happened, say, with uh, Catholic voters and, and a lot of others. But uh, to repeat, let's not be completely naive about the short-term consequences of certain gr groups, certain tendencies of groups, certain dangers associated with certain groups coming in. This isn't a place that's open to humanity. Uh, it's open to certain people who come uh, for, for purposes that serve this nation. And that's not a restrictionist point of view. I think it's a common sense point of view. You can go to Europe and see, see why that's the case now. Europe has a different welfare system. So no, it has a different immigration problem, I can tell you that. Yeah, it has a different immigration problem. It also has a different welfare system because if you arrive, for example, I mean, in Italy or France, you are given housing, you're given medical care, you're given a way to support yourself. So coming to the United States, you don't get those welfare problems. And any problem we have with our immigration is not an immigration problem, it's a welfare problem. The labor force participation rate of uh, foreign-born is higher than those of native-born native born Americans, because people tend to come here to work. We need more legal ways for people to get in. And our country needs low-skill Americans as well as high-skill Americans. Hi, Bill Nitze again. Um, actually, I would like to be even more optimistic than the speakers. Uh, it's often said that uh, conservatives um, are not uh, true to their principles, but actually the Republican Party has put forward at least three truly excellent conservative ideas, and I will name them. First uh, is John McCain's health care plank on individual savings accounts and treating corporate expenses on health care as income. Wonderful conservative trade-off. Uh, it uh, appeals to using market mechanisms. It uh, enhances individual choice. It reduces the burden on coming generations. And it empowers young people to be creative in terms of how to manage their own futures and that of their family. Uh, I have not heard peep really serious peep about reviving this idea, and I know why. Uh, I ran into a Tea Party member in Boston Airport. We were both headed for Bangor, and he was clearly an enthusiastic member of the Tea Party. We established that quickly. But he also worked for a big European multinational and had a platinum uh, health care uh, program, which he said cost about $26,000 a year. And the idea of actually having to pay income tax on any portion of that was so repellent to him that he wouldn't even think about the idea of individual health care accounts. All right, that's idea number one. Idea number two, George Schultz, a man that I think the Hoover Institute has some respect for, but the best boss that I ever had, frankly, just published in the media, and not the conservative media, but the mainstream media, an op-ed piece which said, climate change is real, but the way to deal with it is not massive federal intervention in the economy through regulations of the type that you were deploring, but through a carbon tax, putting a price on carbon, starting small, experimentally, and building up, and letting the market respond. Now, that leads to number three, and that's Steve Forbes. Everybody's forgotten Steve Forbes. Yeah, he's a little strange, but look, the flat tax idea. That was Alvin Rabushka's idea from the Hoover Institution. OK, all right. But Steve put it on the map, OK? The media again, put it on the map. Well, uh, we actually had Dave Camp, who came up with a bill, believe it or not, in the House of Representatives as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. Now, look, I didn't agree with all the details in the bill. But compared with what we have now, I would have signed it without changing a comma. I would have signed Dave Camp's bill. Did Dave Camp get any support from any member of the Republican leadership in either house? No. His bill sank like an anchor into the Pacific Ocean. Now look, if the Republican Party as the home of conservative principles is not even willing to stand up for its own good ideas, we've got a problem. Houston. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
uh, I'd say this shows something. It shows something about the power of the changes that are being made in uh, recent times that are going on. Every time you lock in a benefit, I don't care whether you're conservative or liberal, how difficult it is to take a benefit away from anyone. And um, we, we keep saying this, conservative or liberal, when it, when it touches you, it's very difficult. That's human nature. And that's the insidious character of this, the development of this thing called the welfare state. Uh, it's easy to enact a promise. It's darn hard to, to take it away. I know this came up with the, the Medicare uh, thing in the last election as well. M many people um, were, were fighting for their, for, for their Medicare on the re Republican side and no cuts in that. Don't take my Medicare away. It, it, it goes up and down. You, you, you have tremendous difficulty uh, fighting this, which me leads me to think the importance of not only changing policies, but changing the institutional framework in which they take place. This policy is just a world of, I don't understand any of it. It's a world of adjustments. I mean, half of pub, uh, national affairs I read, half of national affairs I can't. It's, th it's this and that and that. Uh, it, it's good stuff, but uh, how would I know? Um, the, the point is, though, the, the transformation that is to take place, uh, you do. Uh, it would also, be to, would also be to connect this with uh, institutional changes so that uh, a change of policy would also be a change of power. So that the same people uh, and the same levels of government do not have the same power after the change takes place. For the time being, it would suggest to me a very dramatic change in the direction of uh, more state power. Um, by a whole series of mechanisms with spectacular changes which, which impress the public that this has taken place, like a department or two being abolished. I don't care if it does any good or bad, it will impress people that something has happened, that government can change, that rules can change. And if you look at what's happened over the last eight years or six years in American politics, you see there's been two projects that have taken place. Um, the one, the bigger one that's in the news, is the Progressive Project, which has made spectacular progress uh, in, at the national level. But the other, which has taken place largely at the state level, is almost as impressive. We've had the first uh, attack on elements of, let's say, the progressive elements of the certain elements of the rest of the welfare state that's been taking place in state after state. It does so with less resources, but its political success is considerable. So um, apart from the constitutional part, open your eyes to what's happening. Th this is where uh, a lot of the action is. Therefore, the next change should take place with a, a, an institutional change, which uh, uh, devolves power, not entirely, but considerably, in a way that connects this not to policy, but to a constitution, a constitutional principle. And by constitutional principle, I don't mean what takes place in the Supreme Court. That's irrelevant. These are, those are legal understandings of the Constitution. What needs to be revi revised and, and revived is an understanding of the Constitution that's political. It has to do with the program of a party or a movement, which understands the distribution of power and in which the Supreme Court is largely irrelevant or only plays a role at the margins. The legal determinations of the Constitution are only a small part of what the Constitution is. So, uh, you mentioned the Tea Party. Lots of problems that the Tea Party has in their understanding of the Constitution. But one thing the Tea Party did, it brought the Constitution back into the discussion of national politics and asked the political movement to gauge itself not merely by an ideology, not even the conservative movement, which after all uh, is no more constitutional uh, in principle than another movement, but by the Constitution. That was a great achievement and one to be built on. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, it's, it's a little unfair to Republicans, what you say. I mean, I, I think that the McCain healthcare idea, for example, that you brought up hasn't gone away. Uh, you know, Paul Ryan has been developing it since then, and frankly, Mitt Romney sort of had it too. Uh, he didn't win the election, but I don't think he lost it over that question. And that idea remains at the core of the Republican approach to healthcare in one form or another. And if there is a Republican president next time, it will be pursued in one form or another. I also think that, uh, that Dave Camp's tax idea, which was very attractive, didn't just sink. I mean, you know, Dave Camp was chairman of the, of the Ways and Meads Committee, and he's been replaced by another chairman who's going to try a somewhat different idea, but uh, along similar lines. Uh, and, you know, again, it's Paul Ryan, so maybe there's just one person doing all the good things in Congress, but that's better than zero. And since we're talking about that one person, I also think the, the example of Medicare uh, of, of getting Republicans to support a premium support transformation of Medicare is extremely important in the last few years and is a story that gets at exactly what some of Jim is getting at too, which is 
within a very short time, you got from a place where maybe a fifth of Republicans in Congress would have supported an idea like that to one where all of them voted for it, and the presidential candidate of the party ran on that idea yeah. with all its political risks, and it's a, an approach to Medicare that would have made the powers around the program that defend every last benefit and every last giveaway to the, to, 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 to the relevant industries much, much weaker, a transformation that would have used market forces to empower price pressures to drive our healthcare system rather than empowering bureaucrats in Baltimore to drive it. And, you know, it seems to me that in all these ways, Republicans have made some progress in the right direction on policy. Obviously, they can't get it enacted. The wrong person is in the White House. But I don't think that these have been entirely years of famine on the policy side uh, for Republicans. Jeremy, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think that you have to look at a lot of innovation that's been going on the, in, on the state level. I think there's been a lot of state successes. Uh, and we should look to those as examples of Republican ideas. The carbon tax, I think, is just a terrible idea. Uh, George Shultz wrote that it would be insurance against global warming in case, in case global warming is occurring. But first of all, it would raise the price of our goods in the United States vis-a-vis -vis other goods. So other goods would be cheaper when they came in. Second, uh, it wouldn't lower carbon emissions uh, that much relative to total emissions uh, total global emissions, with the same problem that I spoke of earlier. We don't do anything about China and India and the emerging markets. We're not going to reduce total greenhouse gases. Second, we need to think of a policy in terms of what it would be like if it were in the hands of our worst enemy. It's impossible to totally price carbon. Everyone will say, well, for example, carbon is a big, uh, it, uh, carbon is in food. Are we going to tax food? A lot of people say, well, no, we're not going to tax food. So what else are we not going to tax? There's going to be a lot of picking and choosing. It's extremely difficult to implement. No one in practice imagines that the carbon tax would be enacted uh, as a substitute for any tax. We would instead get a tax increase. So I think it's really good that the Republican Party is so far against its carbon tax and is not going to allow one to get through. Uh, and with regards to Dave Camp's tax plan, uh, I beg to differ from uh, Yuval. The tax would have resulted in an increase in the cost of capital by lengthening rather than shrinking the depreciation schedules, and that was why a lot of people did not like it when it came out. It was constrained by CBO requirements to be revenue neutral. There wasn't any dynamic scoring used, so they couldn't take any economic growth offsets against lowering the corporate income tax. So I think that uh, because of the increase in the cost of capital, it would, that would have occurred, uh, it did not get much support. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but it's important to see that one of the first things Republicans did coming in was change the way they score tax policy. Yeah. And the next time you get a tax proposal out of Ways and Means, it doesn't have to look like that. So exactly. The there Rubio, is room to build right, on in that proposal. Right. For example, the Rubio-Lee draft tax proposal that just came out uh, would be very beneficial in terms of the corporate income tax. It's done a lot of things to streamline the income tax, also that would attract uh, more capital into the country. That was one of 81 means-tested programs. My gosh, when are we conservatives going to say, hey, we got to go after more than one of them. We really have to pull the thing together. When I go through uh, Maryland on the way to our place over at the beach, and I see somebody in a, a food stand, in a uh, grocery store line, handing them their freedom card. That's what Maryland, as you know, calls their food stamp card, well, the one, freedom card. That's one reason we got a Republican governor. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> along, with, along uh, with Illinois and Massachusetts. Yeah, and Massachusetts. Anyway, rain tax helped, uh, too. That was a great one. And on, on your point on welfare, two things. Hoover's own Milton Friedman. Uh, we can't have open immigration where we've got a welfare state. Absolutely. Uh, but at the same time, one of my books along the way, uh, five years ago, the number was 89% of Hispanic immigrants want their kids to be absolutely fluent in English. You know, I mean, that's, that's what pulls them together. And that's, you know, so when we can make the case, I think very appealingly, Diane, as you said, with, you know, emphasizing STEM at one end and, and working uh, people at the other end. Um, finally, uh, two things. Uh, Jim, I really like your appeal back to the 10th Amendment, too terms of where we should be going. Uh, one word uh, for my immediate alma mater. Uh, I was a little late for lunch today because I had to say hello to Steve Forbes at Heritage who was talking about a flat tax. <laughs> <laughs>
anybody know anything about Silicon Valley? Are they going to come our way at all? Margaret? Oh, uh, Netflix has already recanted, by the way. They yeah. say that they are sorry that they were in favor of, of this proposal. And this means that we can have internet taxes the same way as we have phone taxes. And if this can be repealed or rolled back, it would be a great thing. The answer is legislation. I, mean, I think we just they have to legislate around it. I think Senator Thune and who's in the House has introduced legislation to undo this regulation. You know, when you, you think about it from a common sense point of view, uh, forget all the, the legalities, um, which I don't understand, but do you think that something as important as the internet, um, regulation of the internet, and that this takes place without any uh, public uh, debate or, part uh, or participation by the, the governing body of the Congress, as if it doesn't count, from a common sense of view, is simply astounding. It's astounding that something this important can, uh, can result in a policy made by uh, uh, something other than a, a, a democratic body. Take it back to the New Deal. Yeah, the I, FCC I, is part of the part of the New Deal. I understand, uh, and, uh, and and of course, you know, Congress is isn't, is, isn't to, is to blame because it gives these uh, it's, it passes these broad delegations of power, et cetera. That. Uh, that, that, that should stop as well. These would be a series of institutional changes and not just policy changes that have to be thought through because they, they don't merely in, involve the case at hand, but all cases of a genre. And that, it's important to bring that into the discussion rather than what you do here, but what you do as a general rule. And certainly the shocking power in the administration, and, and not only the shocking power, but the way they give Congress the back of their hand as if Congress goes begging for, uh, to them for information, they say, no, uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be back to you next year. Well, it's an example of the asymmetric power between the executive branch and Congress. In fact, Chairman Tom Wheeler was going to do something different with internet regulation. President Obama, uh, even though he's supposed to be independent, even though Tom Wheeler's supposed to be independent, President Obama called on him to regulate the internet <laughs> under Title II, uh, which uh, led to this. If, Chairman Wheel had really been independent, he would have said, well, no, I'm not doing what you said. I am, I am, uh, the FCC is an independent body. But he didn't. He just went along with what President Obama called for. Yuval, Diana, and James, thank you very much for contributing to this conversation. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you. I'll say a couple of closing words real quickly. First of all, um, David, terrific uh, two panels you put together, terrific program. I think everyone here learned a lot. You can tell from the uh, dynamic in the room as the comments were coming forth that there were a lot of heads nodding, a lot of notes being taken. Um, a good conference is great when you have great panelists and speakers, but it's even better when you have intelligent questions coming from the audience. And I don't think it wasn't even one time when I wanted to shut someone down and say, you know, stop giving a speech, ask a question. They were all really insightful, added a lot to the discussion. So thank you for coming. And the highest honor I get today is getting used to the fact that I'm no longer serving truckloads of Chick-fil-A to my audiences. <laughs> Paige Mathis, who's, there she is, uh, responsible for the logistics of today's event. Terrific job, Paige. And it's going to take some getting used to. Wine, cheese, and fruit mid-afternoon. It's really a couple of steps up ahead from <laughs> what we used to do at Heritage. So anyway, thank you for coming. And please stay around for our reception.